Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. This week, I have Colin Wright. Colin is an evolutionary biologist with an emphasis on behavioral ecology. He's widely published in the scientific journals with his research on paper wops, spiders, and ant colonies. Currently, he's the managing editor at Quillette Publication and has written a variety of pieces on evolution, sex, and gender differences. In this episode, we talk about a variety of things. We spend a good amount of time talking about uh, just a general overview of evolution and understanding it as a fact and as a theoretical mechanism. We talk about Darwin and how he outlined evolution and published his findings. We talk about the function and process of natural selection. And we, we spend some time talking about the controversy and, and polarization within academia about individual kin selection versus group selection. Um, we talk about the various aspects of sexual selection. We talk about evidence for evolution and then some of the critiques against creationism and intelligent design. We then shift gears and we talk about the definitions and distinctions of biological sex versus gender. We talk about some of the legal and uh, biological ways of identifying those two. We talk about the nuance and specific aspects of intersex, and then we talk about the practical implications of the conversation around sex and gender, along with many other topics. This was a marathon episode. We went three hours, and you know, I'll be honest, the three hours went by super quick. Um, I had a feeling it might go a little bit long just because of the heavy topics we were dealing with, but really it went by fast. Colin's a great guy. He is incredibly bright, super smart. Um, just the way he's able to distill complex abstract ideas into very concise answers um, just shows his mastery on this stuff. And so it was a wonderful conversation. Uh, I greatly enjoyed it. And I hope to get him back on the podcast pretty soon and we can um, hit some of the other uh, topics we weren't able to get to. So it is great pleasure to bring you Colin Wright. I am here with Colin Wright. Colin, what's going on, man? Nothing much. Just enjoying my weekend so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not. It's. I don't know where over out west, but uh, over here, it's actually. It's not so bad. It's not too cold yet. It's a little chilly here, but it's. I like it a little chilly because it's perfect whiskey weather, and that's what I look oh, yes. forward to. Oh, yes. That's that's always it's always nice to enjoy a, a good glass of whiskey. So, yeah, yeah. There's nothing worse than bourbon in like the middle of the summer. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I'm with you there. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, we have a a few things to get into, and I'm uh, super super honored and and uh, super excited to just get your your brain on here and just all the all the information you got and all your expertise. So it's, uh, I'm really grateful. I appreciate it. And so I'm, I'm excited and I'm excited for people to listeners to hear what you have um, to say and, and uh, much of your past and current research. So I'm looking forward to it. So before we kind of get into it, um, just tell, you know, people that don't know you, you know, listeners that don't know who you are, um, who you are, kind of your past research, um, your field of study, your expertise, and kind of what you're currently working on, what you're currently doing. Yeah, so I guess it depends on where I want to start with it. But uh, I guess I started out when I went to college as being a, a business major. I wanted to like be a business owner and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I quickly found out that that was not the career path for me. I, I didn't do very well in my classes. I wasn't inspired to do anything. Uh, then I sort of dropped out of my community college. Um, actually, if I'm being honest, I got expelled from my community college <laughs> because on academic probation, because uh, I was failing all my classes. And then I went and became a real estate agent for a few years. And so I was a licensed agent. Um, I, as soon as I got my real estate license, that was in 2008, and that's when the real estate bubble market just completely crashed. Right, yeah. So here I was, just like a fresh, freshly minted real estate agent, never had a deal before. And now, you know, there's basically no, no money to be made in it because, well, I mean, I guess if you're a seller's agent, you could have done some. 
uh, made some money, but I was so inexperienced, no one would want to work with just such a new agent. Right. And so I was sort of needing to find another career path at that point. And I had been reading a whole bunch of books on evolutionary biology. It was sort of my my main hobby was reading about evolution. Uh, I was also in the atheist community, the so-called new atheists, pretty hardcore. I had a blog and I would go to the, I even went to some atheist conventions and got some pictures with Dawkins and Sam Harris and all the, all the, you know, score horsemen. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, so I sort of decided that I wanted to get into evolutionary biology. You know, I was, real estate was no longer something I could do. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what else I wanted to do. I was always afraid of math though, because I, I always was terrible in math. And so I wanted to become an evolutionary biologist, but I was horrified of, of math. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I'd have to take calculus if I was going to go that route, because that's everyone needs to take it if you're a science major. Right. But I decided just to go for it. So I, I went full bore in evolutionary biology. I had to go back to my community college to have them let me re-enlist because I was, you know, I was kicked out for having terrible <laughs> grades. Right. And so they let me go back in while I was on probation. So I could only I had a limited number of courses I could take. Uh, and I just took to it so, so well. I had a new passion for what I was doing. Um, I had a goal to become a professor in evolutionary biology. Hmm. I took my math classes. I got A's in all my math classes just because, not because I'm particularly good at math, but I was just studying so hard and I was so focused Hmm. um, that I just wasn't going to let it stand in my way, basically. And so I, I then transferred from my community college to UC Davis, Mm -hmm. because they had an evolution uh, major there. That was one of the reasons I wanted to go to UC Davis specifically, Mm because Sac State had sort of a general biology degree, but I wanted the evolution degree. Mm -hmm. So UC Davis was awesome. I graduated there in 2012. And then I went to graduate school, started at the University of Pittsburgh um, in studying behavioral ecology, collective behavior in in spiders. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my whole lab moved to UC Santa Barbara. So I finished my PhD there. Then after I finished my PhD studying um, a combination of both social spider behavior, collective personalities, and I also looked at uh, paper wasp behavior. I studied personality in queens Mm -hmm. and collective behavior of their colonies. Uh, I then went to, I I got a postdoc at Penn State so I was over there for two years, but during the whole time when I was sort of at the end of graduate school and during my postdoc is when I was sort of really noticing that academia had been changing a little bit, you know, so my, the original reason I wanted to become a professor and get in academia is because I wanted to pursue, you know, certain questions on the frontiers of science. And I was inspired by a lot of the new atheist thinkers who were all about boldly searching for truth and, um, you know, just uh, following the evidence wherever it goes type of thing. Sure. Yeah. And I found that there were some taboos that I couldn't talk about, you know, with especially my field of behavioral ecology, because uh, I studied well, for to a lot of degree. I, didn't, I guess I didn't say, but in, in my studies, I would read all about sex differences and behavior between animals and personality differences, mm-hmm. those types mm-hmm. of things. And there was just this huge taboo of talking about these basic evolutionary behavioral principles in humans, where I could make these claims about, you know, lions or ants or whatever, and sex differences in behavior, but I couldn't talk about them in humans mm-hmm. um, without being called names or saying that that was anti-feminist or something. Right, 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 right. And then this sort of became more magnified to me when I started seeing people online that were not only saying I couldn't talk about sex differences in, in personality and behaviors, but I couldn't talk about sex differences. like. Mm-hmm at all like Mm -hmm. biology like males and females aren't a real thing anymore that was sort of what Mm -hmm. i saw people going down this route right and i thought i must be misreading what they're saying like maybe they're talking about gender as a spectrum or social construct you know identities and expression and it came out to be like no they actually think that biological sex isn't a real thing and so i just couldn't handle <laughs> like leaving that on the table and just walking away and being like, okay, you can believe what you want. Right. So I, I wrote some articles for Quillette and then eventually Wall Street Journal on this topic. And um, that sort of uh, really, I guess, cast me more in the public eye uh, for better or for worse. 
you know, I had a lot of advisors tell me that I shouldn't be doing it because it would sabotage my career and, and all that stuff. And in a big way, it kind of did, <laughs> but uh, it turned out, I guess, to be the a good thing because I'm now working at Quillette and it's a good position I like to be in. I'm sort of in a position better now to combat some of these things. So that's sort of, I guess, in a nutshell where I, where I came from and what I'm doing now. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. It's just deeply fascinating. Just kind of, it, it's interesting, you know, having conversations with people, you know, I, I think a lot of people know um, kind of what people are doing at the moment, but they don't always see the befores. And I think everyone's journey where they get to is always, uh, I think, surprising for some people and just very interesting. And, and I think it can give a lot of perspective. And so your, your story is, is, I think, deeply uh fascinating it's so, all over the place <laughs> no but it's 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 good <laughs> i think it's it's good to see kind of you know kind of the thing i heard in there was this kind of finding the passion and finding the the endurance and the stamina to to do something that was tough and then you did it and and um you know i think that's admirable in and of itself um, yeah well, let me, let me jump on that for one second. You talked yeah. about finding passions and mm -hmm. that's what has always just like propelled me forward and pursuing things. And mm -hmm. that's what got me into academia and got me through my PhD and tried to become a professor. But then over time, my passion uh, faded, not for science itself, but for being a professor when I sort of realized the landscape had, had changed during my entire time in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just didn't think the environment was suitable for someone like me who wanted to think about more outside things and comment on broader societal issues. So I just sort of followed, followed my passion again with that. And I just said, I'm just going to write essays on this whole, all these issues mm -hmm. and see where that takes me. And that's taken me to a place where I am right now, where I think, I think I've actually found my my sort of calling like this is what i should be doing right now yeah. and that's you know, I, you know I'll, I'll be on twitter a lot talking but a lot of it's just also writing articles writing essays on these topics and just mm -hmm. sort of getting my my thoughts out there that's that's sort of what i think i should be doing and that's what i'm i'm doing now so it's been great yeah and i think i think with that i think the thing that's really really nice about that is when someone knows their passion or they're doing it because there's kind of this intrinsic where they find it or, you know, uncover their passion that I think it somewhat creates or it can create a sort of blockade or some type of <laughs> shield or force field from, you know, all the hate and all the, you know, vitriol and slander. Cause it's like, that's, that's cool. Like, that's fine. People are going to do that, but I feel passionate about this and it's not to, you know, troll people or it's not to, you know, <laughs> Just try and point out how everyone's dumb or they don't understand things like it's a passion that you have that's important and that it's serious and and that you found that on your own and i think as opposed to just trying to like you know resist things or just you know cut people down and i think that that kind of can give you some um you know kind of internal strength right because then when people are kind of mean or uh, disingenuous or whatever in their criticisms it's like okay but you know, I know what I'm doing and why, and you know, you found it in your own way. So I think that that's always super positive. It's it's very productive yeah. and active as opposed to just you know defensive or anything else. So I think that's always wonderful. Yeah, it's it's good just to sort of know who you are, know what you're doing. You know, no one knows your intentions better than you are. So when people tell me mm -hmm. that I'm a horrible person and I have blood on my hands or whatever they want to say, right. <laughs> it's you know I'll, I'll listen and you know see if they have any new points. But usually it's you know, I'm just going to keep forging on because mm -hmm. I think uh, I think what I'm doing is, at least in my view, it's, it's 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 leading to some some good results and it's stimulating conversation. And I think that's kind of what we need. Yeah. No. I think I think that's great. I think, uh, and sometimes that healthy confidence can <laughs> be frustrating for some people. It's like, man. You know, I, di I didn't have it before though. When I first started going on Twitter, because sure. for a long time I just I didn't go on social media at all. I had sure. wiped my Facebook and I wasn't. I was tweeting under a pseudonym, mm -hmm. just because I was told that you know if, if anyone links me to these ideas that it could just sabotage my whole career. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah. Um, when I first started getting piled on, like the first Twitter mob that came after me, I just remember my my heart just 
beating out of my chest yeah. and I was just so like oh my god like everyone's coming down on me mm -hmm. and then the next week when that would happen or the next day when that would happen <laughs> then <laughs> same thing I would just have this major fight or flight response mm -hmm. and it was so anxiety wracking and just oh my god my nerves mm -hmm. but now it's just water off a duck's back <laughs> it just yeah. doesn't bother me right, right at all I can just like look at my Twitter mentions and it's a dumpster fire and I can just close it and <laughs> go outside and have a drink and what it's just it's just completely inured to it so there's there's something mm -hmm. to be said about yeah. repeated exposure to this type of thing and yeah uh, it sort of toughens you up a little bit I suppose mm -hmm. um some some of the listeners might be wondering like wow this guy sounds super interesting but man what 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 kind of hate speech is he you know proposing <laughs> that he's getting all this hate from so we'll, we'll get into it and people can judge for themselves yeah um okay so let's let's start so you're you're um at least uh academically or what your degrees are under is in evolution and then um within behavioral ecology and biology and all the rest so let's spend some time on that and i think when i was thinking about it and having you on i was like you know i've been wanting to uh talk about evolution on here for a little bit and i say colin's perfect for this so i'm, I'm excited to, to <laughs> I do hope that. so <laughs> i'd be right i've been out of academia for a while i'll see how rusty i am <laughs> um okay so let's let's do kind of uh kind of basics first and then we'll kind of branch off i have some particular questions that that uh about it that maybe uh, you can also uh, we can play around with okay so i guess the first thing is in in the you know two minute version or or just the very snapshot version, how do you understand um, evolution? You know, evolutionary theory and or fact, if you want to call it that. Just kind of what you're, you know, if you're explaining to you know, somebody about evolution that's ever heard of it, or you know, maybe a you know a sixth grade science course or something like. Just the very basics, like you know, let's just start with what evolution is and and why it's important. Just start very basic. Yeah, I think it's important to distinguish between evolution, the scientific theory, mm -hmm. and evolution, just the observable fact. I think mm -hmm. that's yep. uh, basically the, the main distinction to be made at the outset. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, if you think about evolution as just a general statement that life has changed over time on Earth, mm -hmm. Well, that is just sort of an undeniable fact. You look at the fossil record, you can see how these certain old forms um, were more primitive and how they've sort of branched off in this nested hierarchy structure. And it's one form is, persists for a while, and then you see it replaced by another similar form. And you see in it's you see a general progression of you know like reptiles and mammal-like reptiles, reptile-like mammals to mammals, and so we do see this this progression, and it's in that sort of nested hierarchy where you're, you can say that okay, life is changing over time in in sort of this lineage fashion. That's just sort of the main observation. Uh, evolution is true in that sense that life has changed over time. Uh, then we talk about evolutionary theory, and <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> and when we're talking about evolutionary theory, we're talking about sort of the the mechanisms that are used to explain how this diversity came about. How does life change over time? Not just the observation that it changes over time, but how does it change over time? Mm -hmm. And so right now, the most robust evolutionary theory, well, there's several sort of related ones, but it's basically natural selection. Um, and then there's the related sexual selection, and there's sort of neutral selection, different things like that. But basically, natural selection says that there's organisms out there. They all vary in certain ways. This variation is linked to certain um, heritable properties. You know, they didn't know about genes but at first when they brought it up. Right. And that certain environments are going to select for these different properties. And so if you have a certain property, a certain heritable trait that uh, is conducive to your survival, you're more likely to survive to the next generation and pass on those same traits to another generation. And then over time, those traits will proliferate in larger numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's what sort of evolution is. So if, if you talk about sort of what is the definition of evolution in a modern sense, it's the change of allele frequencies over time. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the academic 
distillation of what it is. And all that means is that over time, certain different genes are going to be selected or variants of certain genes. And so in the next generation, if there's evolution, there's going to be a different proportion of those genes, a non sort of random selection for certain traits. And that's when you have, and, and that it's linked to an environmental factor of some, some point. Mm -hmm. And that is what we mean by evolution over time. So this is seen in labs on short scales. And then mm -hmm. so you often get you know, some of the deniers, I think, are going to say, well, you know, that's evidence of microevolution, but not macroevolution. And they think that you need some whole other theory to explain these larger scale changes. But there's really no difference between between micro and macro evolution. It's just it's just more time. Uh, so that's sort of my my uh, basic overview of what evolution is. You know, evolution is a fact in the sense that it happens. And then we have a theory, evolutionary theory, which explains the mechanisms. This is the same with something like gravity. You know, like you can. Sure drop a ball on the ground gravity exists ball mm -hmm. falls well why does the ball fall well you know you can go back and look at general relativity and mm -hmm. special relativity you know curved space time that's the theory that uses to explain these phenomena mm -hmm. but there shouldn't be any disagreement that the phenomena itself like exists like those are just mm -hmm. independently observable things so yeah no that's that's great um i think that is something that is a small nuance, but I think an important one is the fact that, you know, some people will claim that, well, evolution is just a theory, right? Like, you know, Darwin yeah. came up with this and that was his way of seeing the world. And, but, you know, it's, if I don't want to believe it, it doesn't exist, doesn't happen. And so I think- yeah, the, They'll use the word theory as sort of like a, our colloquially understanding of theory is just sort of like a, right. it's just kind of a guess, you know? Right. And then they'll put like, I have a theory, like my aunt has a theory on crystals. <laughs> Right, And they try to basically equivocate between those two things, but it really, you know, things don't become a scientific theory unless they actually are explaining a large, broad body of facts under some encompassing framework. And, you know, the theory of natural selection, it's, it's withstood this test of time because, you know, it's mm -hmm. other theories or other, other hypotheses have just sort of fallen to the wayside because they've been shown to be mm -hmm. incorrect. And the last one standing is, is what we have right now. Right, right. And I think that, you know, the comparison of sorts of like physics is like, you know, <laughs> no one's going to deny the fact that if I go to the top of a building and I say, I don't believe in gravity and I just jump off, it's like, well, you might not believe in it, but it's there and it exists and it's going to, you know, it's going to yeah. bring you down to the earth, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I think in the same way evolution is true. Um, and that, yes, there's the observable facts, things change over time. But then there's the you know, kind of the theoretical underpinnings that say, okay, here's how it changes or why, or some, some questions of why. And so there's, there's a few things with this. There's reasons why people get uh, or have and still do get upset about this. But I guess let's talk about a little bit in terms of, let's, I guess let's start with Darwin and then we can go from there into like the natural versus sexual selection piece. So Darwin goes to... If I remember correctly, he had um, he had some ideas. I'm forgetting his background at the moment. He had some ideas about this before the Galapagos, or all of this just kind of hit him when he went to the Galapagos. I can't recall. It's been a while since I've read sort of the history of Darwin, but he had, I think, pretty much outlined a lot of these ideas mm -hmm. before the Galapagos. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, yeah, he had. I mean, he was set on this thing for like 30 years mm -hmm. or so. But and there it was, was a, it was the was Galapagos. A, contemporary right that also had it was back back then it was like whoever got published first got the credit for it or whatever there was somebody else that was also kind of aligned with him as well that just didn't get there yeah first. that's so the alfred russell wallace that's right yeah, wallace. Yeah. although like some people try to portray their relationship like I've, there's a book called the the song of the dodo mm -hmm. and it really mm -hmm. paints darwin i think in a in a really negative light like that he stole these ideas from Alfred Russell Wallace and he went and published way before he did. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Darwin's notebooks, he had his idea of natural selection just like years and years before Alfred Russell Wallace ever even had these ideas. Right. So I, I, I don't really put them on the same level mm. because Darwin's had so much more history to his, mm. his theory and he had these ideas well before Alfred Russell Wallace. Mm. I mean, they both sort of independently came up with it, which is sure. pretty amazing, but Right. Um, if we're talking about like who thought of it first and who dedicated the most to developing these ideas, like right. 
Darwin just slam dunk hand Dar- down. He wins. Darwin's king of the hill. He, he wins it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he goes to the Galapagos and he basically just sees it. Like he just kind of the tangibles of it. So maybe as much as you can explain kind of the why people talk about the Galapagos and, you know, why yeah. it's such a big deal and what were the kind of the specifics and everything. So that story of like Darwin having this epiphany while he was in the Galapagos mm-hmm. is sort of is sort of this mythologized version of of what actually happened with him there. Mm-hmm. So he he went to the Galapagos. He took all these extensive notes on everything, and he um, he you know it was, it was just an amazing naturalist. So he had mm-hmm. this amazing insight, but he didn't actually sort of it, it didn't crystallize for him while he was in the Galapagos. It really crystallized later when he came back to the UK, and he basically had all his bird specimens mm-hmm. that he gave to his name was John Gould at the time. He was just a famous. Um, I don't want to say Oxford ornithologist. I might be getting the university wrong, mm-hmm. but basically, it was later. I'm not sure how much longer after, but Gould came to Darwin and told him that you know all these birds that you found on these different islands, they're actually all finches, right? And whereas Darwin thought they were just these completely different species, and so it was actually these revelations that came to his attention after he got back to the UK uh, that really sort of solidified this idea for him the fact that these were all finches and they all all these different versions were from these different islands uh and the fact that the galapagos they're these they're these volcanic islands too mm-hmm. so you know the, a lot of them they know how sort of old they are and so they know that these couldn't have evolved you know th- these couldn't have just been, unless they were specially created like you know in super recent history uh then there's just no explanation for why they should be changing during the, in this pattern that's just unique to these islands, especially when these variants don't even exist on the uh, on the the mainland. So mm-hmm. it was sort of this revelation that they're all finches, but they're all slightly different in different ways and specialized on eating certain different nuts and seeds and whatever. Uh, that that was his sort of, I guess, mm-hmm. epiphany moment. So with the finches, specifically, you know, as the kind of, I guess, you could say the. Mm, kind of the springboard of sorts for this what what was it about the finches that kind of said you know kind of started to solidify some of the ideas he had about natural selection um you know kind of make that link for for or what was the link that darwin made maybe if you explain that a little bit yeah it was basically just that from all the different islands in the galapagos archipelago Mm -hmm. um if you had a certain island that it was close to another island, the finches would be much more similar than if they were further apart. Mm -hmm. But still, each of these islands had their own sort of species of or subspecies of finch that were there. And on Mm -hmm. islands where you had multiple species, uh, they were clearly related to a species that was found on the mainland, but they were different. Mm -hmm. But they, they specialized in different different ways of getting food in their environment so sometimes their beaks would be pretty huge and they could crack these giant nuts or their beaks would be more slender and they could get small seeds out of these crevices and sort of the volcanic rock they had there Mm -hmm. and they each had their own specialization their own niche and it was this sort of radiation of of variation of different sort of uh beak phenotypes coloration all all of that that fit within his sort of nascent idea of what natural selection was and that it was selecting on on certain traits uh that would push populations in sort of different directions based on uh based on what what's their specialized way to to collect resources in a certain environment yeah no that makes that makes a lot of sense And all all this has been followed up by sort of the peter and rosemary grant too they have Mm -hmm. they're sort of the big finch researchers and they've validated a lot of uh, sort of Darwin's early ideas on on the evolution of finch beaks. There's a really great book called Beak of the Finch by hmm. Jonathan Weiner, I think is his name, mm-hmm. and uh, it goes over sort of all their research on on uh, on finch evolution. It's fascinating. Yeah, I th- I think I mean maybe we can uh, get at this a little in a little bit, but I think the power of Darwin's evolutionary theory to explain what's what's observable. Is the fact that it at no point, I mean, this was in the mid 19th century, right? 
at no yeah. point has there ever been something substantial enough to be like, yeah, this this doesn't work. Like even as we keep progressing through time with different um, technological advancements or different understandings about medicine and science, it it almost just becomes stronger and stronger as you just keep doing Darwin's homework. And it's just like, oh, like here's another point. Here's another point. And you know, yeah. kind of maybe to to what you're saying there with the study of the finches. There's so many fields in evolutionary biology that is basically derived from a single sentence or paragraph in Darwin's writings. It's just yeah, like, it's oh, incredible. yeah, I just, I can't say how many times I've been, you know, you research something and it's like, oh, who came up with this idea? It's like, oh, Darwin came up with that. It's just in a notebook, random one night when he was dealing with malaria or something. It's just like, mm -hmm. okay, Darwin on malaria is better than me at my best day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Pretty amazing. The, the guy was incredible yeah. i mean he was and, and if you think about it too it's all done in a time where we haven't discovered genes yet genes, we didn't even yeah. know we didn't even know the mechanism of inheritance you know he had this idea of sort of blending inheritance like almost mm -hmm. how you like blend paints mm -hmm. he sort of tried to come up with the theory of of uh heritability i think if i'm not mistaken it's been a while since i've done this um i think it was called like gemules or gemules he mm -hmm. had where he thought that different areas of your body would sort of when you would use them they would accumulate this certain type of molecule mm. and then when you go to reproduce like the proportions of that molecule in your body would then become represented in your in your gametes mm -hmm. and so you know it was almost sort of a Lamarckian thing where if you use something a lot you'd have a higher proportion of mm. gametes would come into your into your your sperm or your ova Mm -hmm. And that would be how you could actually select for certain traits over time and have like directional evolution on certain one traits that wasn't completely blending because, you know, if, if you, if it's just sort of blending paints, mm -hmm. you can't get too many generations where everything is just sort of a grayish greenish, you know, drab. Mm -hmm. So he needed something that could actually create sort of this, uh, this, this the, the beauty that you see, the structure, the nuance of, of these different types of, of selections. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah and i think that's I, I know like with genetics probably 30 years ago and then you know every decade genetics just you know lunges forward even further and it's just always confirming even when it's not trying to uh <laughs> darwin's you know uh theory is what makes it so powerful so so okay so let's do um so kind of so we kind of set the i guess table with the finches and a little bit of galapagos and his work there so and you've sort of done it already, but maybe a little bit, a little bit more. What is natural selection, and why is it so important? Or how, well, first, how is it seen and understood? But then, why is it important? I guess for the theory. So natural selection is just based on a couple like basic assumptions, um, which are basically just observations at this point. Mm -hmm. So that you have variation within a population between different organisms mm -hmm. you know, not every individual is identical uh, it also postulates that at least some of this variation is not environmentally caused but it's caused by genetic variation it's so it's heritable to some degree um, that some of this variation is going to be conducive to individual survival mm -hmm. so not all of this so you can have variation that's heritable but if it's not linked to survival then whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have like hair color it might not be conducive to survival unless there's like a um, <laughs> sexual selection uh, right. thing going on there. Um, and so if it's conducive to survival, then there's this sort of statistical argument where you say that, okay, there's this struggle for existence then because they live in an environment that is not, you know, infinite resources. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some competition for resources and any heritable, heritable variation that will allow certain individuals to accumulate more resources or to produce a higher number of offspring than others relative to them. Uh, then selection, the environment will be in a sense selecting, you know, not consciously, it's not like picking individuals, but right. just the facts of the environment mean that some individuals are going to survive at a higher proportion, some are going to die. And then when the individuals survive, they're by definition passing their heritable variation onto the next generation. The ones that die, by definition, unless they've already reproduced, they are uh, dying with their genes that didn't allow them to survive very well. So you get this sort of over time, over many generations, you get 
this change in the gene frequencies that are that are leading to sort of directional selection on one or several or a bunch of traits at uh, at, at a time. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic sort of theory of natural selection. And it's important because before there were sort of these notions of evolution that that weren't really working they didn't explain uh what was going on they had like lamarckian evolution which was based on use and disuse and then people would do experiments where they're like chopping off rat tails every generation it's like nope all the kid, all the offspring still have tails <laughs> uh, so it wasn't conforming to reality for one right and two uh there was a lot of other ideas out there that were sort of more theologically based that were you know we were created by god and things like that and he right. there was evolution where he's guiding it directly and this was sort of just a natural selection is just a, a way that you can get the diversity of life that you have right now without proposing any sort of outside agency that cares about humans mm -hmm. or any other animal for that matter. It's, it's a complete uh, non-agentic way where you can explain the diversity of life uh, without reference to any sort of higher power or something. So um, that was the most powerful part of it is that it was just a first principles mm -hmm. um, discovery of, of how this could have come about just by the, uh, you know, the clockwork of, of nature, basically. So that's, and that's, that's basically it. No, that's great. That's great. And, and so this happens at the molecular level, and then all the way up to the species level, correct? And there's almost this like, interplay between the two of them. So um because I think of Dawkins and his whole selfish gene type of thing, which, you know, was a really big uh, piece in evolutionary theory, but it's it, natural selection works at the molecular level and then goes scales all the way up to species or how, how do you explain it in terms of them? I guess you could say uh, yeah, micro versus a, macro. You've just walked into a huge minefield of <laughs> debate where <laughs> evolutionary biologists will just, depending on, your opinions will just scoff at you and mm -hmm. yeah, so this this brings up a whole like uh individual kin selection versus group selection i would i have that on the list to get into so maybe we can we can <laughs> is, we can hand yeah. wave to it now and then get into it as yeah, we that is a along. that is a dense thicket of debate and snarkiness <laughs> and people at conferences refusing to even use the urinal next to someone who's oh, a filthy goodness. group selectionist and yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's so i mean it's such a particular esoteric debate but people they just get so pissed <laughs> so so okay so <laughs> it's funny it's very funny um give me i guess the broad you know broad brush strokes of that debate you know you don't have to go too deep into it if it's you know it's kind of a, <laughs> a funny nuanced thing but broad brush strokes of that and then kind of where where you fall on it yeah, so there's this, there's basically, I want to say like two camps. Mm -hmm. There's sure. the individual selectionists, and then there's like the group selectionists. That's This is a very broad brush, low resolution. Mm -hmm. um, the kin selectionists, basically, the, the debate usually comes about where we're trying to explain altruistic behaviors, like why are you kind to not only a relative, but to a complete stranger sometimes. In humans. Um, in any animal, yeah, humans too. But why do you have like why would a bat regurgitate blood into a non-relative's mouth to mm. feed it? Or mm -hmm. Why would so it does go across? It does go across yeah. species too, not even yeah. just social mammals or mammals, but it could also go for other uh, classes of of animals as well. Oh, yeah. and this Insects al altruistic and thing. everything, yeah. Okay. I mean, it even goes to bacteria. There's some altruistic, self-sacrificial bacteria. Okay. So these were sort of behaviors that um, were considered like how could this possibly evolve you have individuals that are sacrificing themselves for uh for what appeared to be the benefit of the group or at least certain other individuals um and this was seen as sort of a paradox in evolutionary theory because any any gene that you have that favors you to sacrifice yourself for either any other organism or even like a non-relative is well that your that gene that you have of self sacrificing is gonna die with you and so by definition mm -hmm. it can't evolve because any individual that has it is going to kill themselves and they're going right. to bring that gene out of the population mm -hmm. and so the individual selection of people think that you can explain all of this altruistic sort of behavior with 
these sort of models on individual selection. So there's um, kin selection, for instance, is um, based on the principle that you might, sorry, it's based on the principle that you share genetic material with your closest relatives. And so if you're being kind to your, your parents or to your brothers and sisters, that this is because, it's not because of any, you know, just the goodness of your heart, but that you share about half your genetic material with your brothers and your cousins, uh, well, cousins, you know, one eighth, um, and that you're kind to them and are altruistic towards them in a sort of a selfish reason because they share copies of your DNA. Right. And so it's actually in those genes best interests, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's the genes have agency, but um, mm -hmm. there will be selection to favor being kind to relatives simply because of the shared genes. Mm -hmm. There's other ideas of who will get and why are we being kind to, to strangers sometimes? So there's all these kind of models of, tit for tat, reciprocal altruism, sort of I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Mm -hmm. And so the individual selectionists think you can explain all of this seemingly altruistic behavior by reference just to the basic principles of, of uh, kin selection and reciprocal altruism, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have other individuals, other people, um, Edward Sloan Wilson's out there, um, E.O. Wilson, I also a lot, of, a lot of Wilson's on this side. <laughs> where they think that evolution can actually take place at multiple levels, not just on the individual level, but that there could be some some scenarios might not be the most robust form of selection or the most prevalent, but there are certain situations where you can have actual selection between in the whole entire groups of individuals. Um, that's sort of there's this complex statistical argument that comes out of there where it depends on if you have individuals that are sort of fission fusion societies that are you know, coming together and breaking apart, um, but their survival of individuals and their, um, sorry, basically the, the reproduction within these groups favors certain traits that are beneficial for, for groups. So the groups that have higher levels of cooperation mm -hmm. will basically explode and their populations will expand much more than populations that don't have as much cooperation or the genes for cooperation. Right. And that these populations that are growing a lot more, they'll pretty much swamp out the the genetic frequencies of these other alleles mm -hmm. and so that you can get sort of a population level selection on group level traits mm -hmm. that will assist in the evolution of sort of these altruistic behaviors. And so this would be more of the group selection um, camp, right? That yeah, there is, yeah. that there is some type of evolution that happens based on group as opposed to just the individual uh, uh, yeah. level. Yeah, there's, there's been some famous experiments here, like some with like chickens that mm -hmm. is pretty, particularly well known where they say, you know, if you're a chicken, um, if you're rearing chickens and you want to have more chickens, if your goal is to just have, you know, the highest number of chickens, uh, what do you, what do you do? <laughs> so the, some of them were, um, they would, or sorry, if you're selecting for the number of eggs that are laid, I think is what it was, what they did. Right. They would either select the chickens themselves that laid the most eggs and then bring those into the next generation in mm -hmm. their separate cages. Because they sometimes they'd have cages that have, I think, eight chickens to a cage. Mm -hmm. And so they would say like, okay, we're going to take all the chickens out that have the, mo that lay the most eggs and then put those in the same cage to with each other. And then that's, this should increase the number of of eggs that we have over time if we're selecting individual chickens. Mm -hmm. Another way you can go about doing it is you can select the individuals of entire cages. So this mm. all eight individuals, if you're just looking at how many eggs did this entire cage produce, okay, if this, this entire cage produced more eggs than this, these other cages, if you then select individuals in those cages and then go to the next level, uh, then you can have sort of directional evolution on the number of eggs that are produced. And what they found is, if you're actually just selecting on the, the individuals that are producing the most eggs, mm -hmm. the number of eggs on a cage, uh, the, the entire cage produces actually plummets because it's selecting for these mm -hmm. other traits uh, where the chickens are basically pecking at each other. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's pretty gruesome pictures of what happens yeah. when you just oh, select yeah. individuals. Oh, but if you oh, select yeah. whole cages, you're selecting for nice interactions between the individuals in the cages as well that make it more mm -hmm. conducive to laying more eggs. So that's sort of a classic like example of, group selection being able to um, actually produce a certain result at a population level, at a group level that mm -hmm. you can't get just by individual selection. Right. So yeah, those are some interesting experiments. So it, it, 
it's a, it is an interesting kind of debate that people have. And so I guess I, I still want to stay on the natural selection piece, but yeah. since we're here, uh, I just, why do people get so animated about this? Or <laughs> I mean, I've seen some of these debates I know, cause then you can, you know, you apply this to humans, right. And then this becomes even more, um, uh, heated sometimes, right. You know, are we selecting for groups, um, as you know, in terms of different, you know, population centers around the world, or, you know, is it just at the individual level? And there's, you know, plenty of, uh, sociologists and, and probably more specifically social psychologists that will, um, kind of sort of advocate for that. Um, I think, I think even, I think, um, I think even John Haidt has, has made some kind of, yeah you know, hand waving to group selection. And, you know, he's a social psychologist by training. So of course, you know, that kind of makes sense. And, but I think EO Wilson also has done some of the, uh, the group selection stuff, but people get angry about that. And so I guess what, what is, I guess the biggest, you know, these kind of two camps or whatever, <laughs> why does it bring the outrage, I guess? I, I think a lot of it has to do just with the history of the idea itself. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the people you have right now, you have, so people don't use like to use the word group selection because it's sort of become a naughty word. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why it's the, 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 the rage. So you get what people now call multi-level selection. Those are the new group mm -hmm. selectionists. And then you have the kin selection mm -hmm. people and individual selection people. Um, I really think a lot of it comes back to just the history of how the I first ideas of group selection came about. Mm -hmm. And right now people are sort of talking past each other because the individual selectionists just keep holding these modern multi-level selectionists to a, a notion of group selection that they no longer believe in, that they've they've since ditched and have progressed on. Right. So back in the day, I don't remember the years, I'm terrible with like names and dates, but it's, it's this one guy named Wynne Edwards. He sort of had this idea of group selection where if you have like a imagine having like a herd of buffalo or something and they're all about to cross a river and the river's just teeming with with crocodiles or something and they're just waiting to take off to start eating these um mm -hmm. these buffalo he'd have an idea of group selection where it was just like you see this this uh old buffalo just would run through the group and they would just throw itself into the lake and into the river just to sacrifice itself, you know, for the good of the group. So while it's getting torn to shreds, the entire group can just like, you know, walk across in safety. Mm -hmm. And so he had this notion that you'll have this sort of sacrificial behavior for, for the good of the species or the good of the group. Right. And that's basically completely false because as I mentioned before, any individual that has this gene that would compel them to sacrifice themselves for a group of, you know, sometimes somewhat related, but mostly probably non-related mm -hmm. individuals, well, that gene is going to be selected out of the population. So you should right. get selection away from this type of self-sacrificial mm -hmm. behavior. So that was his idea. And then people rightfully sort of said, this is insane because everything we know about evolution says that this type of behavior can't happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then they've developed all their ideas of, of kin selection and reciprocal altruism and all these things for things that appear self-sacrificial, but are really sort of, uh, sort of not because they progress, uh, they, they still put their genes in the, um, in an indirect way into the future. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it, the individual selection is properly pushed back on. And he, he's this guy, Wynn Edwards, has basically been the dunce and the whipping boy in <laughs> every evolutionary biology textbook since. You just look at him and it's just like, this guy's an idiot, <laughs> which is bad because he actually did some good work, I think, with birds and their, their sort of uh, um, respiratory behavior, things like uh, uh, systems, hmm. which is sad because I hear that's good work, even though he's just known for being like this, this idiot. <laughs> but... Um, but what the group selectionists now are sort of saying is they agree that that type of group selection is insane, that things aren't evolved for the good of the species. They sort of have more of a nuanced argument that there are some traits that a group can possess that an individual can't that are, can maybe be selected for. It's not going to be the strongest form of selection, but in certain isolated cases, there might be some behaviors that you can't completely account for maybe based on 
the individual sort of selectionist approach. And then when those occur, we should be able to note those, you know, they're, they're, they don't see themselves as competing with individual selection as like, we can explain everything you can do under our new paradigm. That's not what they're saying. Mm -hmm. They're basically saying this is, this is a, an addition. There's like a, an, an additional aspect we need to be looking at in certain special cases where you might have, you know, those fission fusion societies where cooperation in the groups is going to swamp out the selection on between group competition mm -hmm. um, or within group competition. So that's sort of where I think it is now, or at least where it should be. But you still, when you go to conferences and you get the people giving the multi-level selection talks, everyone's just like group selection, boo. They're, they're, I think they're using this old idea, the Win Edwardsian right. idea. Right. And they just, I think a lot of times they're really just straw manning it and they're just creating a caricature of what the new group or multi-level selectionists are actually saying. I find myself sort of agreeing with both of it. I think the individual selectionist is the most robust type of sure. selection is probably responsible for most of the adaptations you see in nature yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. But I also agree that, you know, we should be looking at special cases where maybe group level traits can, can be selected upon. So yeah, I'm, I'm no, not great. the most controversial person on, on that whole thing. <laughs> Although people, oh. me, me just saying that would make people say like, oh, you're a filthy group selectionist now. So. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's good. I, I haven't, yeah, I want, I was super curious about that because I kind of also had um, in my reading of, of evolution theory, I always kind of, at the very least was like, I would always kind of frown at group selection and be like, hmm, I don't know, I, I'd have to, you know, read more or think more about it. But I, I, I never really, I was always a curious thing for me as I didn't like totally disregard it, out, you know, right off the bat. But it was always interesting. Like, I don't know how much comparatively uh, evidence yeah. we have compared to it's, individual. It's such a complex, such a complex argument. I mean, when I first started reading about it, I think I read Dawkins first. And so he was very anti mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. selection. And I'd read Dawkins and be like, screw group selection. These people are idiots. And I would read EO Wilson or, EO Wilson or Edward Sloan Wilson. Right. And I'd read their arguments and I'd be like, oh, wait, yeah. the individual selectionists are idiots. And then I'd read Dawkins again, and he would address some of their arguments. I'd be like, oh, wait, no, never mind. Dawkins is right. And then <laughs> over time, I would just go back and forth so many times, and I just sort of eventually came to the position that was, was a lot of the times they're just kind of talking past each other, and yeah. that maybe, maybe they can coexist in it some non-antagonistic it, way. It's like evolutionary biologist version of you know certain theological debates in seminary yeah you gotta be in one camp and and you know you gotta pick a side and so yeah okay so let's go back to real quick to natural selection so maybe we can use um kind of because i think time is important and then we can jump to sexual selection which is super super fascinating so basically natural selection is in each living organism on the planet they're trying to promulgate their genes into the next generation and to survive. So that way, the whole, the whole goal here for all living organisms is survival. Yeah, I mean, there's the people who are going to push back on you using the word like they're trying to or the goal is because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, it's sort of a teleological thing. Yes. I, know, I know what you mean when you say, but people are... Right. Gonna, not that, they're they're, they're, they're going to jump on me for not calling you out on it. And then they're going to, you know, <laughs> even though, even though when, when biologists talk to each other, we use this kind of language, but we all know that right, what we right, mean right. is like, they just so happen to have the genes that cause them to survive, you know, right. As yeah. though that they're trying to, <laughs> right. So I won't, I won't try to dunk on you. Yeah. That. So, you so mean? yeah. So not to, to, to be, um, yeah, to be more specific actually is to say like, yes, not that the, genes have some kind of sentience that they're pushing that or whatever but that in in, ter in terms of a educational aspect right the best way to i guess think about natural selection is how how to how to with the cooperation of the environment how do genes get to the next generation and yeah. how do they how do it's they just survive like a mindless it's a mindless generation. statistical phenomenon basically right and and that there is no necessarily rhyme or reason and that there doesn't have to be right that yeah. that that is like that is what's happening yeah, whether you, just you like happens it to you be don't like the it. case yeah people right. often try to say that it's like a tautology saying that like well 
which individuals are the most fit? Well, the ones that reproduce the most. Well, which are the ones that reproduce the most? Well, they're the most fit ones. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, a, it is sort of a tautology, but it's also just an observably true one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, we can kind of pass that one. So, so again, so let's, maybe an example might be helpful for some people. So one of the things um, <clears throat> that people sometimes push back on is, well, okay. How, how do we understand how life has evolved over time and how we have so many different species, right? You know, how, how is it possible that if you, if you read the history of life on earth, right? Life on earth is uh, 4 billion years old, right? Is that right? I think three and a half or something is right. I mean, it kind of changes every once in a while, like small. So you start Small with uh, bacteria, microbes. Where's it? Where's the the single cell uh, organism or whatever? I mean, there's there's a whole debate about what's considered the first life and all that stuff. And is it a, right. a crystal that reproduces itself? Is it like right. life? Yes, that's a whole thing. But yeah, I mean, basically, some sort of. I mean, well, if you go back, there's like the whole RNA world hypothesis that mm -hmm. everything was RNA first. But I mean, I think a lot of people like to just start with bacteria because it seems like that's sort of the sure. the closest thing that we can call like living that has its own sort of metabolism. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so something like that. If you yeah, if you take that and then it <clears throat> just branches off, so natural selection based based on the environment again through time is okay this is going to reproduce, reproduce, reproduce in whichever fashion. And each time it reproduces, it's somewhat changing and you need millions of years to do this in for species. So I guess, for example, right, there's fish, and then you get amphibians, right? And then you get like, you know, water to land, and then you get, you know, all the different um, ways species go, and then you get all the way to social primates, and then you have um, the common ancestor for humans and chimps and bonobos and all the rest. So maybe just explain how natural selection works in terms of how we have so many different species and, and how that occurs maybe as a, as like an example. Yeah. So what a lot of people I don't think fully appreciate is the role that isolation plays in shaping uh, groups to diverge. Okay. So some of the most common models of evolution, um, they call it allopatric speciation. <clears throat> Excuse me. One second. <clears throat> and allopatric basically is this like, allo means I think like alone and Patrick is sort of like it, fatherland. So alone in your fatherland is sort of what's meant by that. Mm -hmm. And what, what that means is that a lot of evolution takes place when you have some sort of barrier that is separating two populations where they're no longer in communication with each other genetically. And so they are just basically any sort of variation in their environment or even just neutral selection by random statistical chance, mm -hmm. the composition of genes in these populations are going to diverge over time. Mm -hmm. I try to think of it a lot like how languages evolve. You know, you'll get mm -hmm. certain... Yeah. You know, you look, you get, you have French, you have the Germans, like even though historically they're pretty close to each other, you can make, you can make evolutionary trees of languages. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even, even within a certain language, you have different regional dialects. And this is basically because there's some level of isolation between these populations, where if you're not talking to someone, this entire group, even though you might all start speaking California mm -hmm. English, like I do, <laughs> over time, you know, if I come back to this group, a hundred years later, even though we started all from the same population, mm -hmm. we're probably going to have wildly different accents, uh, new words that are going to come up that they're going to use. And if you just extrapolate that over time, you get whole different languages where we can no longer speak to each other when if we ever meet back to uh, meet back with one another. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of, I think, one of the best ways to view what evolution is. And that's you have this isolation that happens. Maybe a river goes through a population, maybe mm -hmm. um, just climate variations you know snowy mountains versus you know whatever mm -hmm. gradients too that just cause populations to move away from one another and if we're talking about bacteria i mean this can just be you know they're just in the next puddle over like a foot away i mean this, these <laughs> right. things can 
And so just over time, you get this, all these different scenarios where you have isolation and selection. And then even in the same environment, sometimes if there's different ways to exploit certain resources, you can have individuals that sort of form to, to exploit different niches in their environment where maybe they can't reproduce with each other again because their behavior starts to change where they're not overlapping during the same you know, reproductive seasons and things like that. But it's basically this, this main argument of how populations diverge and then you get this new population and then that's going to go under, undergo the same processes and eventually split. Multiply that by three and a half billion years. Yeah, you get, you get a lot of different species out there and the vast majority of species have all gone extinct. I mean, we're only seeing mm -hmm. the ones that have survived up until today. But if you look at sort of the evolutionary history, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just this huge vibrant branching tree and most of those lineages, like 99.9% .9 of them have all gone extinct. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we see sort of this discontinuous evolution. We have, you know, cats and dogs, and there's not a whole lot in between those or between fish and, and whales and things like that. And like, there are interesting evolutionary histories between those. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the gist of it, I suppose. Yeah, no, no, that, that's great. Can you, let's give a, I want to give for, for listeners, maybe like a, like a really good example of like, I guess because it's sometimes it's somewhat that a visual of what you're explaining in terms of the isolation and how things work, right? Of one species to the next species over time. Um, can't think of it. I mean, maybe you have a good idea of an animal that can kind of be a good um, yeah. Well, some of the example, some of the living examples that people like to talk about are these this phenomena called ring species. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. Maybe, but. Not sure. Yeah, there's there's a species that sometimes it happens with birds and there's, I'm sure there's a lot of examples but one of the best known examples is with these salamanders in California mm -hmm. and basically there's these this mountain range in California and all around the mountain there's these salamanders okay and they exist in a continuous range around the the mountain but the mountain range is so vast that you have the situation where you have this all this uh variation in, in the way that these sal salamanders look like you actually have what are considered like i think five or six different species but there's this nuance to it because like are they really separate species because every mm -hmm. population that's directly next to one another can reproduce with each other and so the, this population can reproduce the one next to it can reproduce with the one next to that one as you go around the mountain but as as you begin to close in around the other side of the mountain where they two would meet at the very end they can no longer reproduce because they are genetically more distinct uh, mm -hmm. at the two tips, the end of this sort of horseshoe, mm -hmm. than anywhere along the range. So in a way, like the two areas uh, where the areas almost meet, you have two different species, even though every little bit along the gradient of this range, they can interbreed. Mm -hmm. and so that's sort of an example of just, you know, this population is awaiting for a uh, some sort of barrier to separate them forever, and then they'll actually split and never be able to recombine ever again. You get some bird species too that happen up in the in the north where they, they sort of have the same variation, um, where like they, they can interbreed with the population directly next to them, but then as the further you get away, they can't reproduce with the individuals hmm. at the very end of that spectrum. Uh, so that's sort of this uses sort of an example of sort of a living population that is both one species and two almost because they 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 can't interbreed at the mm. tips mm. so that's yeah. that's one example then you also have like the darwin's finches whole thing with uh we know what the original ancestor was like on the mainland and then how this gave rise to all these different uh the different variations that we see on the islands yeah so i guess basically another way of saying it would be that there's basically a the same animal and they reproduce right so they have a copulation they have sex and they have however many offspring and they do this you know each offspring each generation does this over time but as the, they're doing this as their environment changes nature is selecting you know which is going to survive you know in terms of at the genetic level and at the the uh, cellular level what you know what's going to be enough for each each uh, uh generation to survive and then as the environment is changing 
the next generation is going to be a little different as it, or could be a little different as it goes until at a certain point, it's so, this is kind of go to your language piece. It's so far from the original that it looks completely different now and you could classify it as another species. Is that a very butchered way of saying what you're saying or? Yeah, I mean, there's again, there's whole debates on what a species is as well. That yeah, the is also a very fiery right. debate. <laughs> you know, the the classic definition is like, can these two populations, if they recombine, can they can they reproduce and create a fertile offspring? You know, so you get the whole, mm -hmm. um, you know, horses and donkeys. They can they can reproduce, but they make a mule, and a mule is sterile. So that's what keeps the horses and donkeys. They're considered separate species. Right. But that doesn't apply to all life because you have asexual organisms and, you know, they, they don't mate with each other, so they don't produce, right. you know, offspring together. And so and there's ecological species and morphological species and behavioral species where, like, they, <laughs> they could conceivably reproduce, but they just have their behavior so widely different than they, they never show up in the same place at the same time mm -hmm. to even have that be a possibility. So, yeah, so it depends on what you're, what you're looking at and the nuances of every, yeah. every sort of species. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, I want to talk about humans, right? I have, I have sort of like a, in my mind, I kind of, uh, I have like yeah. a, uh, humans. Act, I, act I hope one, I can, two, I hope I can do well on humans because I've, I, I'm used to studying in my, my own research was very insect and arachnid focused. So, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just now starting to try to get into some of the human personality research because, uh, I did animal personality stuff and the way it's done personality is approached in both humans and animals is like completely different so uh, as it probably should be i mean <laughs> i think it probably yeah should be i mean yeah they, they use completely different traits but i mean you'd think that if you know humans are animals and primates like why do we measure personality different in humans that we do in primates mm -hmm. you well know, i mean the, the main reason we can't have primates can't fill out questionnaires i suppose so that's, uh, <laughs> right the main yeah. reason so let's let's talk about sexual selection real quick and then we can kind of branch off into a little bit of, of humans and then all the other stuff I, I do somewhere i'll fit in or maybe as an example you, we can talk about um uh, uh was it wasps and spiders right that was your that was your interest and, or, yeah and some ants too some ants, ants yeah so maybe we can use those <laughs> examples though okay so we have natural selection i think we've covered that pretty well there was this other weird thing and i think it was in the Darwin's Descent of Man, or I think it's referenced in Origin, or those like kind of towards the end. It's been a while since I've read Origin of Species, but he kind of brings it up. But Descent of Man, right? Isn't that where he talks mostly about sexual selection and lays it all out? And it, that's like most of the book. Yeah. Um, so having natural selection, you know, kind of uh, bouncing around in our heads, how, what is sexual selection? How is it different? And why is it important? Yeah, so sexual selection is kind of just a special case of natural selection. So they're not like, I mean, in some way, they sort of have an antagonism going, and there's like, they can pull in different directions. Um, sexual selection is sort of based on this idea that you have certain traits that can increase your ability to attract a mate and reproduce that have otherwise nothing to do with your ability to you know uh, fight or the ability to stay warm or any of these other traits we might associate classically with um being conducive to individual survival so they have like a mm -hmm. they have no bearing or at least very little bearing on the survival of individuals and in some sense these traits might actually appear to be uh, deleterious and decrease an individual's mm -hmm. uh, capacity to survive in their lifespan so classic I, uh, examples of this are something like the peacock's mm -hmm. massive tail. Uh, it's just this all the glaringly, colors. yeah, colors. all the colors and just not just the color, but how big the tail is, how unwieldy it is, mm -hmm. how conspicuous it makes them to predators having just this, their entire body is just this metallic green, mm -hmm. all these crazy colors. Um, they can barely fly because this huge tail just pulls them down as they're mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. So how could you have this thing that evolves or makes them the least agile creature in the world? It makes them the most conspicuous creature in the world. <laughs> when you have things like wolves in, in areas that are, you know, that would ostensibly just eat them no time. Right. And the answer to that is that, you know, while they might actually be detrimental to them 
strictly speaking in terms of survival and longevity, mm -hmm. they communicate something to the opposite sex that makes them very attractive to them. Uh, so they're, what they're losing in terms of ultimate survival, they're making up for in strict reproductive output, you know. Um, there's these ideas of, you know, why are some of these traits so attractive to, to females? Because mm -hmm. if these traits are arbitrary, you wouldn't expect females to really, um, or, you know, there's section back and forth between males and females, but you would expect um, selection to become relaxed on any trait that's not actually connected with something that's, uh, that's, that's relevant, you know, for mm -hmm. survival or something. So there's these notions that, you know, a peacock that's able to to have this crazy colors and maintain such amazing plumage must have very good genes must have really super good immune systems to yeah to not have um you know be infested with lice and be um not have just this inability to to maintain their their plumage and so this says a lot about the constitution of that individual mm -hmm. uh that they want or there's other ideas too called like a, the sexy sons hypothesis where you know, you're just gonna, you're this individual is so attractive, not because the genes really say a lot about the individual in terms of its output, um, and, well, in terms of its, you know, how robust it is as an individual, mm -hmm. but you just know that for whatever reason, females have, they find this very attractive. And so you just know if you have this trait, even if it's arbitrary, it will make sure that your sons in the future have mates as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's these sort of feedback loops that you get that sort of, perpetuate this selection on these exaggerated exaggerated traits uh, that you wouldn't expect to happen just if it were natural selection alone straight selecting mm -hmm. just for survival so, so it's so, yeah. so with sexual selection it's with the purpose <laughs> or you know the idea is for reproductive value right and that's another way in in a sense of surviving yeah. of course but you're in the case of the example of the peacock um, with the uh, the tail and the feathers and everything and the colors, this is more of what's uh, uh, labeled the sexual ornaments, right? The ornamentation of of the animal based on you know the colors and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the patterns and all the rest. And you see this with certain types of birds in certain areas of you know the world, right? If you're in Latin America mm -hmm. or in Southeast Asia or Australia, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Even you know for us as, as humans we can say like this is you know super beautiful and it would in some ways seem antithetical because it's like well you're going to be more exposed to predators and all the rest with these you know bright yellows and bright reds and all these things mm -hmm. but that that you know for when they're trying to find a, a suitable mate that you know that's the sexual ornamentation is what is appealing for then reproductive um, utility but then it also seems, again, specifically with birds, um, and maybe some of you can use an example if there is one for uh, ants or moss or some of the research you've done, with um, behaviors, right? That there is some re reproductive value for certain behaviors and or personality, right? So I think about birds when they, when they make the certain nest or they have certain mm -hmm. kind of dancing that they do, and it is yeah. to impress the, the, I think in most cases, the female or the mate. Um, and so it's not just the sexual ornamentation, but it also is some behavioral things as well. So maybe you can uh, talk about that. Yeah. So it can be it can be behaviors as well. And there's these ideas where you have like these elaborate bird calls for one, mm -hmm. uh, where the more elaborate they are, these are could be correlated with sort of the the mental capacity of these individuals. There maybe smarter birds can have more elaborate calls. Mm -hmm. um, it is indicative of sort of the good genes, the good, you know, neurological genes of these individuals. Right. right. Yeah, the certain dance type behaviors that you have. I mean, this shows they need a lot of coordination. Mm -hmm. Coordination is something that's beneficial in all sorts of contexts for survival. And so, yeah, the, this, these are the kind of ideas behind these things where like, well, wouldn't it just be beneficial if, you know, these males aren't expending so much energy to, you know, to be dancing in these really strict ways. <laughs> right. And in some sense, yes, but then it's also communicating some sort of information to females about their uh, the quality of their genes to some degree. And so the females are, you know, it's 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 not a waste of energy because the payoffs of in terms of reproductive output right. uh, swamp any, you know, negative 
treat uh, any negative effect that you know dancing in an open environment while you're wearing a clown suit essentially with a lot of these birds have mm -hmm. you know that seems kind of dangerous but uh the there's payoffs that are out offsetting these uh, these costs and in some ways it can be especially with birds and some of them when they're trying to essentially impress the mate with the coordination of the dance sometimes they will also have other you know male birds that coordinate that with them even though just one likely mm -hmm. is going to in essence win the approval of yeah. the female mate yeah. so it's, it's not That's even so, just a coordination with one bird it can sometimes be a variety of others yeah you get those they're called lex where you have multiple males that are gonna basically um be in a big group because a big group of them will attract a wider ver variety of females to a certain mm -hmm. area they're sort of more conspicuous Mm -hmm. uh, but then the other sort of subordinate males, they're almost always related to the, the dominant male that's there. Mm -hmm. And so they're basically doing that whole kin selection thing. They're, they mm -hmm. would, they're doing better by making their, you know, their, their brother or, you know, close relative who's just this super hunky turkey or something. <laughs> you know, it's, they get more of a reproductive payoff by contributing to it reproduce than they would if they're just reproducing on their own. So there's this, uh, that's how a lex form. And you actually get lex in wasps and other species too that are kind of. Does it look the same or, or how is it different, I guess, for wasps or, or other, other yeah. species? Well, for the, for the wasps, it's very similar. They all, a lot of males gather in a certain area and they basically do these sort of contests with one another um, based on the blotchiness of their, of their faces mm -hmm. that indicates which ones are more dominant. And then you get the females that are sort of watching along the sides and um, the dominant male gets to sort of have the reproductive mm -hmm. reproductive output. It's only in some paper wasps, not all of them, but it's mm -hmm. very similar to sort of like a, a turkey lek or any other species that does a similar thing. So with all of these things, so you can have certain behaviors, you can have certain sexual ornamentation based on the patterns or designs or colors of, the, of certain species. All of this is for sex, right? They're doing all this because they want to reproduce, right? So copulation in certain... Uh, uh, species is well I mean it, it looks different than it does for <laughs> primates or humans right there's there's different yeah. it feels or it seems uh, maybe I'm wrong on this that it's more I say mechanical but it is <laughs> like functional of like okay we're going to do this thing and then that's it you know it's over in three seconds and <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I mean, how does it function the, I guess that's the currency of natural selection is basically reproductive output and not just strict number output but what's more important is the relative output it's not that mm -hmm. you're really the absolute number of offspring you have doesn't really matter for evolution it's the uh Quality. relative proportion that you have you know compared to other individuals in your population that's gonna mm -hmm. evolve the population um in a certain direction mm -hmm. um i guess i guess that's a that's a good that's a good uh overview of this i mean what else am i missing from or what else would be important to know about sexual sexual selection uh i guess in general that we haven't mentioned if, if anything you know i'm not i, I it's, it's not my specialty sexual selection so i'm sure there's a lot of sexual selection people studying butterflies out there that would <laughs> be well <laughs> more able to answer your question on this mm -hmm. there's probably a lot of questions i knew some people who studied butterflies and they're looking at sort of how selection happens in environments where you have like very closely related species of butterfly and have different morphs where the mm. the males of a population sort of have a certain morph that looks exactly like the male of another population and how do the females distinguish between these two species and, and when they the ranges where they overlap and, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of more nuanced i guess arguments of uh sure um sexual selection and i, I do know that brett weinstein has He's at least voiced um, some skepticism of sexual selection arguments in that they're capable of explaining sort of all the diversity and, and ex extreme forms of life that we see in, ter in terms of ornamentation. Um, I'd love to chat with him about it because he, he he's so far made sort of vague claims in this area that I would like to explore. Yeah, it's interesting. But, uh, yeah, I, I would really be interested to see what he thinks about it because he, mm -hmm. he seems to think that there is sort of the logic of sexual selection breaks down and can't explain certain things like the peacock's plumage uh, to some degree. 
Um, and I'm not sure why it is. And when asked, I haven't, I haven't really been satisfied with hmm. his answers. So maybe interesting. Maybe I could have him on and talk to him or something. Yeah, no, that's super uh, interesting. Yeah. So, okay. So real quick, I have a few more things on this and then we can switch gears. So, okay. So we've covered evolution in a general sense. We've talked about natural selection. We've talked about sexual selection. So, and I know that you, you've stated it's not your area, but so when we get to humans, right? <clears throat> um, maybe just because it's a it's a common myth that I think bothers most people, um, <laughs> bothers me, probably bothers you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you get the the folks that say, well that's preposterous that we come from monkeys, <laughs> right? Which is, you know, I feel like it's just been dispelled so many times at this point, but just briefly tell us how we don't come from monkeys. Well, so the way I usually hear it is like, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? That's what I, that's yes, like a, right. a common argument that I'll hear. Yeah, that too. Or, or humans, if we've evolved and we evolve and we do this thing, you know, why do we stop evolving, right? Why are we branching yeah. out into other species of sorts? I mean, I've heard that too. Yeah. So there's two things there. Like, so the, 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 the whole, like, if we came from monkeys, which we actually came from apes, well, our apes, yeah. um, you know, the whole, like, if we came from monkeys or apes, why are there still apes? That's just, that comes from like a fundamental misunderstanding of like what, how evolution works. I mean, <laughs> the, the equivalent would be, you know, America, if we came from Britain, mm -hmm. why are there still Brits? You know, like, <laughs> that's basically the equivalent of that. Like, you know, you look at the history of us, and I mean, it's, it's basically a one to one perfect analogy where it's, yes, it is. Like, <laughs> it's like we came from, yeah, we evolved from certain primates. Like, we, we didn't evolve directly from uh, chimpanzees like they're our closest relative but mm -hmm. the way to look at it is like both us and chimpanzees we're like crown species we're currently existing species mm -hmm. equally evolved as one another mm -hmm. but we share a common ancestor mm -hmm. what is it six or seven million years ago? i can't remember the that's number that's they give right now uh, we share a common ancestor that was neither a chimp nor a human mm -hmm. but was still a primate mm -hmm. um so that's the way to look at it you know we it's it's sort of a family tree type thing Mm -hmm. where you know you can do the same thing with countries you know as you can with with these uh these concepts of monkeys uh and how we came from it and then what's the other one you said that we we stopped evolving or yeah or, or yeah if, if if there is some species that continue to evolve or or there have been species that you know it, it evolves over time then why do humans not keep evolving and if we just keep reproducing you know humans have been on the on the earth for what 200,000 years yeah. why do we I mean, not we, evolve we hear that a lot but i mean this this notion that we humans are no longer evolving i just i don't understand how people can think that i mean it's <laughs> mm -hmm. people we we there are certain standards of beauty that people find more attractive so there are ways that people are selecting their mates that is non-random mm -hmm you still get the case where you get, you know, taller, more muscular men on average have more offspring than, than shorter, you know, smaller men. That's still, there's still a higher reproductive skew mm -hmm. among males than there are among females. So there's, there's right. selection going on there. People often talk about, you know, um, there not being any, any selection on in humans anymore because, you know, everyone's just, everyone reproduces or something. Uh, but you get this case, so there's an example of the fact that w women on average favor men that are taller mm -hmm. uh, on average, or at least taller than them. Mm -hmm. And they've done these types of uh, experiments where they'll, they'll observe just a bunch of couples at random. And they show that, you know, if, since males have a certain height distribution and females have a certain height distribution, you can calculate you know, these are overlapping distributions too. Some females are taller than some males. Right. And you can calculate based on these distributions what proportion, if they're, people are mating it completely at random, what proportion should have uh, of these couples should the female be taller than the male in these populations, in these, in these groups. Um, and I, I don't know what the number is, but you can just, there's a number that if, if they're mating at random, if they're selecting based on just random properties, mm -hmm. what that proportion would be. 
But when we actually look at the actual proportion of how many couples have uh, females taller than the males, it's like one out of every thousand. It's like it's such a small number mm -hmm. that is way smaller than you'd expect by random chance, which shows that yeah, females are not necessarily selecting for the tallest male, but at least taller than they are. Mm -hmm. So at least in this in the whole realm of um, of selection in humans, yeah, there's there's still selection going on for for height and males, and I'm sure a bunch of other traits that we can't even comprehend right now that we're unconsciously selecting. I don't know if this fits entirely with it, but <clears throat> I was in uh, I was in oh I've been there a few times, but I think it was maybe the first time I went. Yeah, I think it was the first time I went to uh, Ecuador. Uh, which is cool. What the second time I've I went, always I, wanted to go. Yeah, I went to the Galapagos, and it was oh, so jealous. Oh, yeah, it was so cool. I mean, the marine iguanas and the finches, and I went yeah, to three islands, and so I, was, I that was like the thing I wanted to see the different finches, and they, I mean, they look very. I mean, you can tell they're the same, but they look different, like enough to be distinct. Yeah, and it was. It's it's cool to see it and hear the the songs and all. It's it's super cool. But when I was in the in the Andes. I was um, I was talking to 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 people, the locals there, and I, and then I was reading a little bit about it. And apparently, in much of the Andean countries that that, that um, or that sit in the Andes, so you think about you know Quito, and then all th the cities throughout the Andes, and then all the way down through Peru and and all in Bolivia and all the rest, that um, at least males, I don't know if females, they have larger lung capacities. Um, than people do, let's say, in the United States or other places because of the altitude. Um, that It's hypothesized that they developed larger lungs so that way they can be able to breathe and have better oxygen levels because the air is so thin as a product of the environment in which they've grown over time and all the rest. So I don't know if that's an example of basically that certain humans or humans based on where they're at in their environments are going to adapt based on where they're living at. Right, that wouldn't make yeah, any absolutely. sense for for you and I because we don't live in <laughs> mm -hmm. fifteen thousand feet above sea level or whatever. But yeah. um, that's maybe one example for for some folks. Um, okay, so yeah, I think the I think the thing with the you know with with apes, um, you know, because if you look at the, the this kind of the evolutionary history and then the anthropology of at one point there was four types of humans living on the planet. Right, Neanderthals, the yeah. what are the ones in Eastern Europe called? Um, the Australopithecines and all kind of yeah, yeah. The, the demo. My, my, my knowledge of who is all existing at one time was pretty. Yeah, there was there's at least four. Bad. I know it's <laughs> Astropithecus and then the Homo erectus and then you know the Homo sapiens. Homo habilis and, and, and yeah, there's there's all these yeah, classifications and Neanderthals and, can, and yeah, you can tell this by the the, the different um, uh, skulls that we have and the skeletons and all the rest. But even within the apes, you know, we're probably closest to bonobos, and there's not that many of them left, but closest, um, or we fit, sit somewhere between bonobos and chimps. But the fact that I think this helps when I've explained to people showing the um, kind of the skeletons, but then also showing the thing that helps, I think, with evolution, right? We didn't even talk about convergent types of evolution and all that stuff, which is super cool. Oh, yeah. But um, in terms of, okay, you have, you know, let's say one primate, and then you see over time that, you know, when you're able to see all of the, the evidence from their various uh, skeletons and skulls, okay, it branches off into these two different uh, uh, apes now, because it's so much time and so much pr production after that. And then that's the best way to understand that we don't come from apes, but we have a common ancestor millions of years ago. And I think the arguments that people have are, well, how can we know that? I mean, it was, you know, so long ago, how are we able to know? How are we able to know that it was, you know, so many million years ago and all the rest? And then I, I do think that's where, um, you know, convergent uh, evolution uh, is helpful here. Maybe just give briefly and then we can uh, shift a little bit. Kind of convergent evolution and how that works and all that because i think that's an important feature of understanding species and how they're similar and dissimilar in some way yeah 
So let me try to think of the specific question. You're looking at the, um, so, so if, if there's convergent evolution, those are like two more or less unrelated species that have converged upon the same sort of type of uh, same phenotype where you can get, That's for right, instance, yeah. like the, like wolves and the uh, um, thylacine, you know, the, mm -hmm. the uh, marsupial wolf mm -hmm. uh, scare quotes, where they look very similar. They serve like a very similar niche in their environment, um, you know, sort of a predator that goes around and either scavenges or hunts small prey. Uh, they look very similar, but they're they, they don't they're not similar looking because they share uh, close ancestry. They look similar because they've evolved to exploit the same type of environmental niche. So that's that's what the convergent mm -hmm. evolution mm -hmm. uh, is. Um, yeah, and I, and I think sometimes you can have certain also. Um, I don't know if this would be completely aligned, but you know certain vestiges that we have as well, right? There's certain things. You can look at this humans, but you can also look at it in other animals as well, where it's like there's certain things that are there that aren't necessarily used. Um, I don't know. It's a, yeah, those it's are my a, favorite types of things, like for the in terms of evidence of evolution. Right. It looks like um, an ostrich is kind of this way, right? Don't they have like, you know, they don't, I mean, they fly, but not like a hawk yeah. flies, you know. Yeah, or, flightless or, birds is a really great example of mm -hmm. individuals. It's like, why it is, you know, why would an ostrich or a kiwi? Mm -hmm. Or any of these flightless birds, like why would they exist? Why do they have wings if they can't fly? Right. You know, and this is this, these wings are basically they've gone down. They they they've evolved from a flightless ancestor, but you know you can't just evolve, you know, like human hands mm -hmm. in the next generation. They need to work with what they were given in the previous generation. You know, they can only right. they can only build upon where they came from. There's a whole you know history that they are bringing with them. Uh, you know, another good example of these sort of atavisms which is the evidence of of previous traits that are no longer being selected for is the these leg bones mm -hmm. in a lot of these hip joints you have in in the cetaceans like the whales mm -hmm. uh, whales mm -hmm. and dolphins where they'll have these little hip bones in the back and these sometimes they'll even have um it's usually within their bodies it doesn't hang out from the outside but i think sometimes you can even have them on the outside these little little legs or leg bones mm -hmm. with you know toes and everything on the inside yeah. they serve absolutely no function whatsoever right but if you understand that whales have evolved from land mammals mm -hmm. that had hind legs that slowly over time got smaller and smaller until now they're just sort of inside the whale mm -hmm. not you know they're, they're not hurting in the whale they're not um and doing anything good for it so they're just slowly mm -hmm. accumulating mutations that are just gonna eventually make them probably dissolve but uh yeah that's, that's some of the best evidence I think for yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it's with the with the the fins, right? I mean, if you look at the skeletal structures within the yeah, fins, the flippers, yeah, it, yeah, it looks almost hands. you know their hands. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you just look at the the structure, yeah. and some people hypothesize that for humans, you know, it's like the tailbone, right? It's like we don't we don't you know people you know I don't know if it's more apocryphal, but it's like maybe this was something that we used to need or have. Some people say about the appendix, like we don't need it, but what do you have? You know, people make certain ideas with humans and how that looks like. But um, and I always always think one to me when I was learning about evolution and I took more of an interest in it, the the really compelling argument I guess for humans, and it, I had to get across that idea of like humans are different than everything else. It's like, no, we're just all part, you know, just a species, just like any other yeah. species on the planet. And once I got that, I always thought that um, how we, so this will bleed into our next topic, but how, how we give birth to humans is like the same for, or for most mammals. Yeah. <laughs> we all do it kind of the same way. And I was like, Oh, like the just the like aspect of uh, pregnancy and how we do things and um, you know breastfeeding and all the rest is just like oh, that that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> like we don't hatch eggs, like, yeah. <laughs> right? Like there's other it's mammals, early mammals yeah. that are doing that. It's like oh, we're in that umbrella species. Like it mm -hmm. just like intuitively made sense. It was like oh, okay, and you know we have you know different subsets, but it's like you know mammals. <laughs> yeah i mean you get, you get a lot of people that think that you know we're so different than any other species and i just never understood that perspective because if you just look at any specific behavior or thing we do like i mean we're just we're just mammals mm -hmm. like any other <laughs> mammal mm -hmm. given birth and right yeah 
breastfeeding and all kinds of stuff. So I just want to, I want to, one last thing, and then we'll jump into uh, some of the stuff you've been talking about more recently and interested in, and I think writing on. And I know that you, we could spend literally a whole podcast on this and refuting it. And I find that stuff kind of, I don't want to say it's boring, but I don't know, maybe I've just heard it a lot. Yeah, no, I so mean, it's, this is the same way. <laughs> so, so there are people that are creationists and, and believe in intelligent design and, you know, God created, you know, the earth and the planets and the universe and everything in it and created humans and they're made in God's image. And so evolution couldn't be true. And you have people that do this. And <clears throat> so for you, maybe just a summary of it, what do you think are the best ways to, because I, I think I'll put it this way. I, I kind of have a, um, now, I guess, a distaste for people that just try and tear other people down or just say, let me prove your arguments wrong. So I think it's fair or it's fine to say, <clears throat> okay, you know, this is a, this is one way of looking at things. Let's see if it holds up and, you know, if it does or it doesn't. And I don't think uh, intelligent design and creationism holds up. I don't think you need it to understand the world, um, but people and a lot of people, you know, think you do, or some people try and do some like third way or middle ground with it. But for you, uh, cause I know you've, you've run into these types of folks and all this stuff. So what is it that is, um, you know, kind of some of the strongest arguments about, you know, refuting some of those uh, claims about folks that believe, you know, God created the world in six days and, you know, created humans in his own image and all the rest. Yeah, it's hard to know where to start with that. Yeah, I know it's a whole <laughs> big thing, but... Yeah, what... it, it, it would really depend. I mean, I try to just... depends on the specific argument being made. You know, if mm -hmm. the people are coming at you from the young earth creationist yeah. point of view, I mean, there's just... You can know some basics about geology that shows something like, you know, well, the Grand Canyon, I'm sorry, can't be created in... 6,000 years. It's just, that's not possible. But, um, but Colin, how do we know it was millions of years? Old? Like, <laughs> were how you do there? We know that? I mean, yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. And well, I mean, for a lot of these, you have to go and look at things like either carbon dating or the, you know, uh, the, the ion clocks that you have different, different types of molecular clocks for establishing how old the earth is. And, so there's there's that whole thing. There's looking at you know the rates of evolution we have right now and trying to so show that could we have all this diversity if if um, if the Earth is only six thousand years old given how slow evolution happens. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always try to just to go and bring people back to the, the actual evidence on the ground that we have for things like like evolution and how these just don't make sense under some other paradigm like intelligent design or special creation things like that like. Why do whales have these vestigial mm -hmm. leg bones in them? Why why do they have um, these certain oh, I can't remember the name certain fish who have they've sort of evolved the same niche as like a, a a stingray where they're flat, but since they came from a fish that normally swam upright, you know they lay if they're laying flat on their side and they have this crazy morphology where their the eye that was on one side evolved to just grotesquely move onto the one side of their body, so they're they're like a flat fish, but they didn't do it the same way that like a mm -hmm. stingray does and any intelligent creator would or any, you know, engineer would have made this thing completely, you know, would, would have made it completely different and only makes sense if you understand that, well, it looks this way because it started off at this other point and had to just sort of gradually, you know, accumulate traits that made it this grotesque thing right now. Mm -hmm. Um I think that looking at just the biogeography, the distribution of species over the earth mm -hmm. are in such a way that you that can only be explained by if these things had evolved from a certain certain area or you know at least is consistent with their the history and trajectory where these animals moved through space and time. Um, fossil record is a huge thing, I and mean, there's just so many specific yeah. arguments. Any single one of them, I think, is enough to just show evolution mm -hmm. is taking place. But then all of them together, and especially even, you know, the, the discovery of genomes and able to do genetic assessments on things now, too, which, again, fit this whole nested hierarchy of 
of evolution between individuals and is able to even show us exactly how this one gene evolved in this one group that led it to have different colors or have these different behaviors. I mean, there's just so much nuance. Mm -hmm. You can get as nuanced as you want with the evolution thing. And it's just held up again and again and again to the most insane scrutiny. It's probably been scrutinized more than any idea in science. And it's yeah. still yeah. just yeah. is more and more robust and true looking every time you, you, you do. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, again, I mean, that's my kind of reading on it too, which is, if you look at intermediary species, if you look at, you know, convergent evolution, if you look at uh, the fossil record, if you look at, um, you know, certain glaciers, if you look at geology, if you look at, I mean, there's just the preponderance of information. It's like, okay, if you want to use intelligent design or, you know, all the rest, you know, supreme being a creator, God created all this, you you have to answer that stuff first. Like, how do you deal with the, I mean, literally you could fill buildings of evidence now about this stuff that has been scrutinized. How do you, um, how do you answer that? Like, how, how are, you can't just ignore that, right? And, you know, I mean, again, I don't, I don't want to get too much into, I've had these debates, but, you know, you'll get the, much of the answer will become, well, you know, the Bible isn't a science textbook. Okay, fine. So it's, it's, it's telling you how, it, you know, what happened, but not how it was done. Maybe God used evolution, right? You know, yeah. and people that are, um, you know, they use the gap theory from Genesis one to three, or they or one to two. Um, they use, you know, all these certain hermeneutical gymnastics to try and explain it. Um, other people will say, well, uh, I think the Catholics do this. You know, at some point, <laughs> you know, when apes were evolving and, you know, branched out to chimps, bonobos, orangutans, gibbons, and then the different uh, subspecies of humans, at some point, God put a soul in there. And, you know, the, the whole, we don't know when, or the, uh, my favorite is when folks will say, well, you just have to have faith. That's it. And it's like, okay, so we're supposed to do all this other work for evolution and all the rest, but because you can't you know, answer a few things and, or, or understand the data or the evidence given by evolution, you know, you just got to have faith that, you know, what the Bible is saying or whatever religious document uh, or system is saying is just true. And faith kind of acts as this kind of black box that you can never penetrate. You can never question it. And to me, it's, it's making, it's trying to make uh, statements about the physical world with supernatural or metaphysical rules. And you can't play by, I always equate it to, it's like if, you know, people are trying to play tennis on two different courts at the same time. It's like, you can't do that. Like you can, but it's just, you're not playing tennis at that point. You're yeah. using two sets of rules um, for two different constructs. And so I think that's partly where it kind of breaks down a sort. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of the people, so if, if people say that, you know, they just, you just need to have faith. Those are people I can deal with and just let be because they've just shown their hand that they're, you know, they just have this belief and it's unshakable. And that means that I don't need to waste my time trying to argue with them right. on things, but you have those other people who, think that their faith-based view is actually the best explanation for the evidence that we have. Um, you know, you couldn't have evolution take place unless you had a creator that's intervening and, you know, life couldn't have possibly mm -hmm. evolved or started in the first place. And I think the fundamental mistake like all these arguments have is really that they're trying to, so they have this notion that everything is so complex, so crazy that this couldn't have possibly happened naturally. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that is that they're trying to explain this mystery, you know, this complexity of life and everything by alluding to an even bigger mystery. You know, they're just saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we can't explain this. So we're going to then just say that this other crazy thing explains that, right. you know, the, but what I would always respond with is 
however complex they think life is and the universe is and physics and whatever to say that that was just done by God. Like, well, if God is creating this complex, crazy universe and evolution, it would have to be more complex than the thing it created, presumably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you're not really solving the problem of complexity by, by bringing up God in the situation. You're just introducing more complexity in this untestable supreme being or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've just increased the amount of complexity that needs to be now explained. Right. And if, if you're fine with just having this complex God just existing necessarily to explain these other complexities, well, why don't, if so, if, if complexity doesn't need to be explained, well, why don't we just remove God from the situation, you know, Occam's razor right. and say, well, why don't we just, why don't you just accept the complexity? And this, this is just a natural phenomenon. Like why, you know, bringing more complexity into it just makes the problem infinitely worse. Like you can't solve a mystery by appealing to, a, a infinitely greater mystery mm -hmm. and i think that's just fundamentally what they're trying to do and, yeah uh, no yeah i've i've heard the same arguments and i never got it it's like you're trying to um, you're trying to add a variable where there's no space in the formula for it like why are you yeah. doing that like it doesn't really make sense to do that i i mean you're doing it because you you have a certain belief system that has to have that and so you're you're, you're you know pushing that into something that isn't necessarily founded by the evidence and, or there's no space to do it. So um, I think at some point, uh, maybe over the holiday break, um, this was part of the reason why uh, yeah, I was, I was super religious for a long time and I went to a seminary and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this is part of the reason why I left religion and, you know, went theist to atheist was because of this. I just, um, the short version is, you know, I knew, I knew Greek, I knew Hebrew, I did exegesis and <laughs> hermeneutics and textual criticism and all that stuff. And it's impossible to read Genesis any other way than a literal six days. We can't read it any other way. I mean, you can, yeah. but you're wrong. Like <laughs> each, each day wasn't an eon. Yeah, it wasn't an eon. I mean, there, you, if you look at it within the text, the language, um, the, within the, the book of Genesis, when you look at it within other Jewish scriptures, when you look at it within other uh, documents from Mesopotamia of the era, when you look at it within other books of the Bible, the language and how things are worded, there's no other way you can read it aside from that. And people that try to do that you know, some of these liberal Christians are like, well, you know, it's not really this. It's, you know, more of an allegory. It, it falls apart in so many other ways. And I, I spent literally years trying to figure out, is it not a literal six days? You know, from it's amazing that whenever, whenever, a literal, whenever a literal interpretation is shown to be false, it magically turns into a, a metaphor. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, exactly. It's an allegory. It's a metaphor. Defense. And, and it's, um, and I just, again, it, it, you would have to do a lot of gymnastics to try and make it not that way, right? And so, um, yeah, so at that point, it was just like, I can look up at the stars and knowing about <laughs> tonight and talking about general relativity, like I'm seeing backwards in time, um, so to speak, you know, 125,000 years. You know, it's just the time it takes for you to see it, whatever, you know, all of that, you know, all the stuff, the evidence we just said at this point about evolution, it's just, it's too overwhelming. And for a while I sat with the, well, there's some questions that need to be answered. And then finally, I just started saying, no, this doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And then once that happens, then you start seeing everything else kind of fall apart within the system and then outside the system. Yeah. And so it was just like, okay, we can, we can get rid of this. We can get rid of this way of believing mm -hmm. and thinking about the world. And that was tough though. It was a, it was a three year yeah. exit. I, mean, I, uh, I personally don't have a, a conversion story at all. I, we, I was never, I wasn't like raised, it wasn't like an atheist household. We were just sort of never went to church or talked about it really. So I guess sure. in a way it was, it was more, more a religious rather than anti-religious mm -hmm. to sure. describe it. And so, yeah, so there, I never had any sort of, great awakening maybe 
you know, I, I was, I would argue with religious people a lot um, in the realm of evolution. That's actually what sort of spurred me to get so interested in evolution is that I, I heard creationist arguments and they sounded insane. And I just <laughs> bought an evolutionary textbook and started reading it and said, like, yeah. this is awesome. Right. So that's, yeah. That's how... it, it is, a, it is interesting. Um, and I think kind of, you mentioned it. I can usually kind of as like a, a yardstick know how thought out the arguments are from from creationist or or religious people by how soon they have to use the faith thing uh pretty early on in the conversation if it's 10 minutes into it i'm like yeah this isn't going to go anywhere if they're going to use it an hour after debating all right that's fair they got some <laughs> they got some they thought about this they got some good arguments but yeah. um faith just be, kind of becomes this misused crutch because they don't have any other answers um, I really miss the old new atheist debates with creationists and intelligence. And I was so, I was so into that back in the day. That you've I, seen whenever a debate I see, with uh, William Lane Craig, I'm sure of a bunch of times. I mean, he kind of oh, does yeah. these things. Oh, he time. loves, yeah. he loves those debates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just, yeah, I, I see him. I see their heads sort of pop up on Twitter every now and then I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> I want those days again. I want to argue with intelligent design people again, because uh, say what you want about like them and their belief system at least they sort of had a there was some shared reality like we at least agreed on the basic observations of like what things looked like mm -hmm. they just had a different like explanation for how these things came about yeah and we could always talk about them like they 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 were definitely modernists and they they liked evidence and they would like to use it yeah um so i could actually talk to them Mm -hmm. uh compare that to like what we're dealing with now and it's you know we can't even agree <laughs> on the basic observation the basic. <laughs> that like you know males and females exist or whatever it is there, there right, are right. facts to even be dis disputed <laughs> so it's we've just moved to a whole new realm now yeah no that's that's a great segue so um i want to be mindful of your time but i i do want to i do want to get you on this so we'll go for as long as we can and then we'll see how yeah see how our bladders and our, our stamina goes. Um, okay. You're, you're working on, on a book. Yeah. Can I, can I say that publicly? I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am working on one. Yeah. And it's going it, slow, but it's, it's going. That's, that's all right. Um, as, as much as you want, maybe you don't want to say too much about it, but just kind of what's it about and what you're, what you're focused on at the moment in your research and your writing. It's focusing very specifically on sort of debunking a lot of the modern myths about biological sex and the arguments that sex is a spectrum or a social construct or that there's three sexes or that there's five sexes or there's six sexes. Um, it's going to be going over basically a, a broad overview of the evolution of sex. Uh, it's going to talk about the basically why that there is only two sexes, how sex evolved in the first place, um, what we mean when we talk about the sex binary, why secondary sex characteristics aren't definitional of an individual's sex, um, difference between sex and gender. It's basically it's going to be a, a, a broad survey of sort of the current um, discourse that's happening about biological sex, and it's going to try to try to carve out some sanity <laughs> within the whole debate and really to set out the scientific argument for the reality of biological sex basically is how it's yeah. going to be. No, that sounds probably going to include some stuff about academia and the state of it and mm -hmm. um, a little bit about queer theory and how the influence this is having on our modern discussions about biological sex. But uh, mm. yeah, it's basically focusing on that. It's sort of, I kind of see it as, almost like Steven Pinker's blank slate book. He, he covered a more broad swath of things. Mine's going to be much shorter mm -hmm. um, where his book was, you know, the modern denial of human nature. Mine's going to be basically the modern denial of, of biological sex mm -hmm. um, more or less. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. I think um, much, <laughs> much needed. So um, I've, I've heard one of the things that I feel like people do is they, on they just kind of pick a side of whatever the culture wars is and they just get you know they just want to focus all their time proving or disproving the other side so 
I don't want to do that. <laughs> so tell me as, as specific and as technical as you want to be, and we can start general and then go specific on, on some of the main, main points. Okay. What is, and I think, honestly, the, you know, conversation we've just had about evolution is going to be a nice, probably backdrop to this. So for, so we're probably, I guess, well, you can tell me, but we can stick with humans, I guess, if we want to make it specific, but probably with most species. Um, what is biological sex and what is gender and how are they similar or, or different? Yeah, so when we talk about biological sex, we're usually talking about it in mammals, but you can, you can talk about it more broadly too. Uh, it's basically the phenomenon surrounding sexual reproduction, basically how, how these organisms reproduce. Um, if a, let me back up a little bit, find the best way to approach it. Um, so there's two levels that you can look at biological sex at. You can look at it from sort of a, a conceptual framework that talks about biological sex as a property of a population um, where there's sexual reproduction, basically that takes two different gametes to create a zygote and um, these fuse, and then they, they create the next generation of offspring. For, um, when we, for listeners, remind us gametes and zygotes. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, to, so a gamete us. is basically the, a sex cell, like the cell that is being um, either in your body or is being expelled out of your body, either sperm or ova, basically, <laughs> um, that's involved in sexual reproduction. So, in humans and mammals and other species, too, you have sperm and ova come together. They fertilize one another. They create a zygote, which is basically just sort of the the combination of uh, the genes from with the sperm and the ova. And then this is what turns into this gestates and turns into the or the new offspring organism. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about sex on sort of a, a population level as a concept where males and females are defined by the size of their gametes, so the type of sex cell they produce. So males are defined as the individuals that produce small gametes, so sperm. Mm -hmm. This is true for uh, plants as well and reptiles and any other organism that has um, what are called anisogamous gametes, so gametes that are of two different sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, and females are defined as the sex that has the larger gamete or the egg, and it's usually stationary, uh, much larger, has mitochondria in it. It's basically um, has some nutrients in it to begin cell division, all of that. Um, this is seen so in like in plants and flowers as well, correct? Yeah, you yeah. Know. And you can have in, in certain species, you can have, you know, one plant, for instance, can have both male and female flowers or mm -hmm. even on the same like flower, they can have male and female parts to it. But there's still like this male and female that's duality common. that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a there's a binary at a fundamental level. When you get down to like fertilization, you have a sperm and you have an egg. They mm -hmm. need to come together right. in order to create offspring. Then you get a little bit of confusion, and a lot of this is where a lot of the sort of public debate comes about, is when we're actually going to be assigning sexes to individuals. So I just use the word assigning, people are going to jump on me for that. If, when we're actually uh, <laughs> describing or identifying the sex of an individual, if we want to describe, you know, is this a male or a female, it's a little more cloudy because if we define sex as those individuals that are creating sperm or ova, smaller or large gametes, well, I mean, babies, prepubescent males are not producing sperm yet. They, they, haven't, evolved, uh, they haven't developed that ability yet. Right. So is like a prepubescent male, are they, are they male yet? Or they, do they become male later in their life? What if you uh, are infertile for whatever reason? Are these individuals, do, are they sexless? Do they not have a biological sex? And I think the, the main response to that is, well, no, they still have a sex and that when we're actually describing the sex of an individual, what we're looking at is basically their primary reproductive organs that they have. Like, what is their what is their reproductive anatomy organized around the production of? So, if your reproduct if your anatomy is sort of developed around the production of of uh, testes that would produce um, sperm, whether or not it actually does produce sperm, you know, these are what we call male individuals. They have a male body. They have male reproductive. Uh, primary reproductive organs and females have 
female reproductive organs. They don't need necessarily to be functional for them to be considered male or female. That's sort of where some of the nuance, I guess, comes into it. So let me let me see if I can let me frame this in another way. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very yeah. common about this. I think. Okay. In terms of biological sex, in which we define, or which we say male, female, I'm a male. How one fundamental way in which I know that I am what we consider a male is the fact that I have a penis and two testicles and inside sperm. <laughs> that and that a woman has all of the reproductive organs again whether they are functional or not so you have uterus fallopian tubes ovaries uh, vagina the whole thing that's a female what about that and and the, we see that with other at the very least, multicellular organisms. So animals, yeah. plants, flowers, I'm assuming fungi or fungi. Fungi or fungi? Fungi. I say, what do I even say? I think I say fungi. I haven't said fungi. that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. That is biological sex. And so the descriptors of male and female that gets more into like the gender or are we using synonymous terms or so how does this break out because from how i what you've said and how i'm simplifying and reframing it i don't understand what about that is controversial or difficult or yeah incendiary what what, what am i missing yeah so yeah i forgot the second half of the question you asked is what gender was too um so the gender is where everything just goes nuts, basically, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Maybe five years ago or more, I remember people would talk about sex and gender and, you know, what was a trans person? Well, a trans person is someone who has the biological sex of, you know, that they're either male or they're female, mm -hmm. but they happen to identify, they feel on the inside that they are actually the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And that was what my concept and what most even, you know, progressive or, or, you know, woke people thought that being trans was. Um, and that's that, still operating under the assumption, though, of the sex is real. Yeah, the sex is, sex is very real. Like, I don't, I don't see how being trans could make any other sense than to acknowledge that biological sex is a real fundamental thing that's immutable, right. and your identity changes. And that's why some people try to, you know, correct. If you're trying to transition, like, well, you can only, there's only transitioning if you're or something and you're trying to appear like something else so right that's what it means to be trans but they've sort of changed that idea of what it means to be trans um or at least they're trying to people are trying to obfuscate between what sex and gender is um so i i mentioned that when i first started to speak up about some of these things like i was always on board with the notion that okay we can have biological sex male and female be one thing and then we can have the words man and woman be used to connotate individual identity. You know, I would, that was a compromise I was totally willing to make. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're a male, but you're a woman. Like, it takes some, some conservatives don't like that, but I was, I was okay. Let's, let's, take, let's use these words. Sort to of a middle road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Um, but then it was then people who were telling me that, well, you know, biological sex itself is now a spectrum or you can identify as a male rather than as a male or uh, man or woman. And that these individuals, when they identify as something, they really are that sex because, well, sex is sort of a spectrum anyway, and no one's really male or female. There's just sort of variations of maleness and femaleness. And if you can't draw a line anywhere between what a male and female is, who's to say that, you know, who, who's, who's, who can be wrong if they say that they're a male or female? Like there's, there's no criteria where someone can be wrong about that because it's like a, like a light spectrum, like when does red turn to blue? Oh, it's just whatever, <laughs> or red turn to orange or something. 
you know, it's arbitrary. If it's arbitrary in one context, it's arbitrary for all contexts. This is sort of what I've been hearing from people. And that's what I wanted to push back on. So specifically with, with, with gender, and I'm kind of meandering here, I was always fine with biological sex being strictly defined in scientific terms. Um, I only started really complaining when I saw concepts of gender sort of trespass on what I thought was scientific terms. Hmm. So there's many different concepts of gender out there. There's some that are just purely identity based that like I'm, uh, it's just like a psychological phenomenon. If I just happen to identify as the opposite sex, whatever that means, then that's what your gender is. There's other sort of more social definitions of gender as being a social construct where you know, gender is basically the societal norms and expectations that are placed on individuals based on their perceived sex. Like we expect males to be dominant and have be masculine. Mm -hmm. Women are supposed to be, you know, subordinate and be into child rearing and all those things. Like that's one concept of gender. Mm -hmm. I don't really care what people, how people decide, decide to define gender as long as they make a clear distinction between sex and gender. And that's, I just want to keep that wall between mm -hmm. those two concepts. Right. Uh, and I've me observing that that wall is attempting to be um, broken down is what caused me to really push back against this. Cause I think that's uh, sort of getting, getting a little insane. Okay. Yeah. So, so to, to, I guess, to go back to what we were saying in the beginning. So again, gametes, Ova, uh, sperm, biological sex, male, female, quote unquote, genitalia. Two. There's only two. That when you're saying that, so we we define these things as biological sex, which is different than gender. Yeah, depending on your definition of gender. I mean, if more conservative people really don't see a difference, they when they say gender, they just mean male and female. So. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's sort of a right-left split on what gender means. Like Ben Shapiro will say, like gender just means male or female, and he doesn't ascribe to any of the social definitions or identity-based ones, which for is you, fine if that's which how you want to identify it. But it's, for yeah, for you, you don't really care. I'm fine if people want to have their own operational definitions of things, as long as we can talk about the concepts that are underlying these things and not merely have it be a semantic difference and we're just using mm -hmm. um you know we, we need we can't confuse just the the sound of words with <laughs> me making concepts either the same right. or different like if you want to define sex as one thing like okay well let's talk about the underlying phenomenon seeing if we agree if we're right. talk actually talking about the same thing rather than using the same or different words right it okay let me try and because i know it is the words we're using and how we're labeling things and taxonomy is just shifting in, yeah. in a very odd way. So the traditional model, you know, in 1980 or 1990, mm -hmm. biological sex in terms of uh, understanding two different people, um, male and female, was gender was just synonymous with that. It was another shorthand of saying, you're a woman, I'm a man, you know, they, there were synonymous terms, right? You were trying yeah, to say it was, it was kind of a euphemism. Like people didn't want to talk about, you know, what sex are you? Because like sex is kind of a, you know, taboo. it means also intercourse and people, right. Right? so gender was sort of used as a way of sort of a non sexualized way to talk about males and females. What was, so is there, I guess, in the traditional sense, is gender a, a different concept or underlying phenomena? Because one reading I've heard even before all this, and my understanding of it sort of was gender to say that you're a man or to say that you're uh, uh, a woman, you know, as, as, as a gender, right, was to be that most of that 80 to 90% of that is biological, right? So kind of what we were talking about. And then 10 to 20% of that is, you know, cultural norms and traditions and standards, you know, you know, boys play with, you know, cars and like to, they go split the, the wood for the fire and women say, you know, there's just kind of these general, you know, norms mm -hmm. of things. And that gender is 
there's a small percentage when you say gender that is including some of those cultural norms about how we understand differences between men and women. Is that about right traditionally or, or no? Yeah, and that's, that's a, <laughs> definitely a concept. I hear that version of it pretty frequently, yeah. So there's you, a combination of, of biological and social or environmental causes to um, average sex differences that we see that manifest mm -hmm. in behaviors or personalities or mm -hmm. um, preferences. Is that, a, is that an accurate way of stating that or is inaccurate or it just depends? I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good coherent definition of gender. I mean, I, I, I tend to like the definition that defines gender as more of a, um, yeah, a, a combination of biological and social different uh, explanations for, for sex differences that we observed, mm -hmm. um, sort of sex-based uh, roles that we have in society. Um, some people like to call gender just, just the purely biological part of it. Um, you know, any, any evolved sex differences of behavior that's considered gendered behavior. Mm -hmm. Some people think that that should only be restricted for the social mm -hmm. uh, component of it and how society sort of builds up these ideas of what mm -hmm. traditional roles are. Uh, I don't have any really strong feelings on how, how mm -hmm. people want to define it. As long as I know, as long as they tell me how they're defining it, then I, I know what I'm, what I'm dealing with. So in the biological sex definition, this would also go to the chromosome levels? you know, the double X, X and Y, or is that mapping onto some other different construct? So yeah, there, there is a misconception that chromosomes are your, your sex and that if you are XY, you are a male and XX means you're a female. Mm -hmm. I'll even go far enough as to say that any variations on sex chromosome differences, so you can have males that are XXY or XYY, mm -hmm. uh, that these correspond to their own unique sexes uh, it's it's important to point out that chromosomes, while they're important in the mechanism that leads bodies to develop as males, um, or more specifically, the genes that some of the chromosomes have on them, mm -hmm. uh, chromosomes are not synonymous with your sex. Like, I guess a good way to put it would be sex is a phenotype, not necessarily a genotype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can predict your phenotype to a high degree of certainty based on if you have an SRY gene, if you have a Y chromosome. like. But we knew what sex was, you know, what males and females were before we discovered what chromosomes were. Like chromosomes were just sort of, when we discovered sex chromosomes, that was a, a mechanism that led to development. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not the definition of a male or a female, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, if, if we, if we want to look at, if we want to define males and females by mechanisms, you can look at things like crocodiles or other reptiles that have sort of temperature based, they, they, don't, they don't have chromosomal sex determination, they have temperature based where if mm. they're gestated above a certain temperature, they develop into males and or, or maybe it's the I can't remember if the hot ones are developing into males and the cooler ones are females. Um, but if we want to confuse mechanisms with your sex itself, then, you know, crocodiles would have like an infinite number of sexes because they have, mm -hmm. you know, every gradation of temperature that could possibly result in slight variations or something of, of their sex. But when we define sex based on, you know, a phenotype of the reproductive anatomy and more specifically the primary sex organs and gonads, then we, you know, we realize that what we have in common with reptiles and plants and other mammals is the fact mm -hmm. that sex is defined by your actual reproductive anatomy, not hmm. the mechanism that led you there. Yeah, that's, that's particularly instructive because I think most people would make that assumption. You know, double X or XY makes you ma male and female. Yeah. And I don't think you're saying that it doesn't contribute, but that it's not the, the defining thing of to say, you are man, you are woman yeah. kind of thing. It's, it's, the, it's a mechanism that drives the differentiation that happens, that drives development, or um, the genes at least do. Uh, you hear sometimes people will say that, you know, every single cell has a sex because, you know, your cells are either XY or mm -hmm. XX. Um, but no, I don't think a cell, one of your single cells doesn't have a sex. It doesn't have reproductive anatomy, like a, an entire, your, your phenotype does your body is sexed, um, mm -hmm. based on the presence of certain reproductive organs mm -hmm. that you have. Um, I think that's a, it's a big conception. And you hear a lot of people who argue against sort of the, the sex as a social construct people, they'll use these arguments that like every single cell is a sex or that sex chromosomes 
it's only x y x x or x y that's the end of it like mm-hmm. you'll you'll hear these people make this argument i just want to scream and say no no no. you're just <laughs> shooting yourself on the foot like i know what you're trying to say but right so your chromosomes aren't the equivalent of your sex like right. they're yeah. just they contribute but they're they're not sex itself and, and just as a clarifying point for the for listeners the, the difference between uh genotype and, and phenotype is um, correct me if i get my basic biology wrong you know genotypes are kind of the things inside the body they're predicated based on what your genes are phenotype is more the external manifestation coupled with all the other aspects of or parts of environment that are included is that about right yeah that's 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 it so okay so the chromosomes are important they're a mechanism but they aren't the defining way of how we delineate between uh, male and female okay so talk about <laughs> okay so i mean this I mean, this is how I was raised. This is what I learned. This is, I think, a lot of people understand. I don't the 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 political and and cultural aspect of it. I'm I'm less concerned about, it, but more of. And I know there's that's sort of in there, but now we're hearing gender is a spectrum, sex is a it's not a construct. You talk about people being gender fluid. You talk about people that there is a continuum where you can have. Um, you know, there's, there's three genders, there's four genders, you know, all the rest. How do you, uh, for you personally, how, how are you trying to understand and or combat um, or navigate that kind of landscape? Yeah, I mean, I think as I, as I kind of mentioned before, what I'm trying to do is keep that wall of separation between biological sex and sort of social definitions of gender and identity because i think what we're seeing now is a lot of people trying to say that identity determines your sex in a certain way through by some sort of alchemy or something if you identify as a male then you actually are one and you know that's that's just your your biology um they have a tendency to want to say that sex is sort of arbitrary in a spectrum and because you can't draw like any definitive line between male and female because you know intersex people exist therefore these concepts are just completely made up um you know it's, it's like colors on a on a spectrum like we we kind of create them and we, we talk about them existing but they actually blend into one, one to another like where does you know red turn to orange on the spectrum well that's kind of arbitrary um maybe not completely but uh, that's what a lot of people are trying to do is obfuscate about biological sex by using sort of uh, these exceptions to the rule of of males and females um, with like intersex individuals, for instance. If if I play devil's advocate here for a minute, why can't we do that, right? Maybe that is the case. How do how do you know? I mean, how do, how is what I'm saying not true? Well, how do you know? You know, maybe maybe it is a spectrum. Maybe maybe it is just a blend, right? Maybe there's no true male or true female. You know, how do we know that? Yeah, well, it comes back to what we're talking about when we are referring to an individual's biological sex and how it's your anatomy that's organized around the production of one of two very specific gametes, sperm or ova. Mm-hmm. So at a fundamental level, like there are only two biological sexes, male and female. Since there's no third gamete, there's not like something, there's not like a, a spurg, something that's in between a sperm and an egg. You know, this if, if there was some if there was some third gamete that someone's anatomy can be organized around to produce, yeah, that would be a third sex. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now we have intersex individuals that for the most part, they are one of the other sex. They just sort of have this visual ambiguity. But if you look internally, you can see that they have either male or female reproductive organs. Um, I, I, I do carve out an exception for, I think some individuals might actually be sort of sexually ambiguous. You can have individuals that have one testy and one ovary or have ovotestes, which are a sort of combination of both testicular and ovarian tissue. And they can also look very sexually ambiguous and they're infertile. So they we don't know if, if they're producing any sort of, um, gamete. And I think, you know, some of these individuals, they're tough cases. And I think, yeah, maybe, maybe you don't have a sex maybe some individuals are just very sexually ambiguous 
But just because some individuals are sexually ambiguous doesn't mean everybody is sexually ambiguous. I tend to bring up this idea of like flipping a coin, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we know there's actually a study that flipped nickels and it turns out that one out of every 6,000 will land on its edge, okay? Hmm. But a nickel, almost every flip you do, if it's not landing on its edge, it's either heads mm -hmm. or it's tails, you know, and heads and tails don't come in like a gradient. They're not, it's, <laughs> you can't get like a 60% heads if you flip a coin. Right. It's either going to be one or the other, or it's going to be an edge case where it's like, mm, maybe we're not quite so sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that is sort of how male and female should be looked at, where in most cases, you're either male or female, you know, like, even if you're not fertile, you still have unambiguous male or female genitalia. Mm -hmm. In most cases, they are just, they're functional too. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in the vast majority of cases, there's just no ambiguity of what someone's biological sex is. Now, one out of every 5,000 individuals, so almost the same probability as a coin landing on its edge, you have individuals that have an intersex condition. Um, most of them, again, as I said, actually is fall into the whole, they're either definitively male or female, mm -hmm. um, but some might actually land on an edge. And that doesn't really uh, expel the whole sex binary thing. Um, some people are male, some are female, some might be sort of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, as I said, like the existence of an edge case doesn't mean that heads or tails doesn't exist. You know, we still have, mm -hmm. we still have heads or tails, even if there, there is a probability that someone can land on their edge. I have one other counter to that. And then I want to ask about intersex. Yeah. So, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can, I can get down with some of that, but well, you're just, you're putting all of the emphasis on how we identify or define ourselves on our genitals. Like, well, sure, maybe I have a penis, but you know, maybe, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, that's not the only way in which you define manhood, right? Like, can't you, or, or vice versa, right? Like, let's say I have, you know, I have a, a vagina and I don't know, I'm, you know, more prone to, you know, doing Tip, you know, stereotypical guy stuff. Like, is it that when you talk about sex as a binary, is it just that you have those genitals, you're a man, you're a woman, the end? Like, can't that just seems so, you know, myopic? Can't I mean, we're complex people. Can't we have sure genitals, but you know, we identify as a different gender or, or whatever the rest? That's kind of the, the counter I have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think people should be able to identify. However, they want to. I, I think they, there's a fundamental mistake people do is when they say that okay, you're just defining everyone by their genitals. How, how reductionist, you know? We're much more than our genitals. I'd say like I totally agree. Like, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't identify by my genitals. Like I'm a, a biologist. I'm, you know, I, I collect whiskey. I, all the, there's so much more that matters. Right. Um, you know, the, your genitals don't define you as a person as a as a you know, a, a being moving through the world, mm -hmm. it only defines a very narrow aspect about you that says, like, if you were to think about having offspring, like, what role would your body be capable of playing in that process? Mm -hmm. And it's, you're, either you can't play a role because you're infertile or something like that, or you, you have a very specific phenotype that's mm -hmm. either definitively male or female. That's, that's really all it needs to, that's, that's where it should end. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I mean, I think there's other contexts where biological sex needs to be acknowledged in realms of like sports and then to mm -hmm. some degree, you know, shared spaces and things like that. If we want, if we want to acknowledge that females have something, uh, some legitimate fear of sharing uh, environments with males in certain contexts, then maybe they should have female only spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are things that need to be considered. Um, and there's also it's important not to confuse sort of a biological definition of male and female with sort of a legal definition as well. And I think that sort of mm. gets muddled because... Yeah, what's the difference with that? Yeah, so the difference would be we could potentially have a law that legally defines me as a squirrel, for instance, mm -hmm. like hypothetically in a crazy world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but that doesn't actually make me a squirrel, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so to a lesser degree, I think this is similar with males and females. Like, I think there could be some exceptions that we could draw, uh, that we could, we could draw out where someone who's biologically male or female should maybe be recognized legally as the opposite sex for in some, in some mm -hmm. situations, maybe not across the board, but in most things, maybe for like bathroom access or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think self ID just, self-declaration that you know that you're a certain sex should be the deciding factor for it but yeah. um you know who who blair white is uh yes that, like a that... trans youtuber y yes the name is ringing a bell yeah they're, they're a trans youtuber they um look very feminine like if you saw them you would not know that they're biologically male they've been transitioning for a very long time yes 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 they, yeah. they've been on on different uh yeah they're uh, pretty popular interviews and podcasts and all the rest yeah. i have a sort of a faint visual or image in my head yeah mm -hmm. she actually did an interesting video where she decided to go and start using the the male's bathroom because you know some people say that she shouldn't be able to she needs to use the bathroom according to her biological sex when she's, you know, biological So, so she, she, trans, she was born a male and transitioned to female? Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. how it works? But she okay. looks 100% female if you were to look at her. Mm -hmm. um, so she did like a social experiment. She went and decided to just start, start using the men's bathroom. And she was kicked out of the restaurant for doing that because, uh, well, she didn't tell anyone that she was trans. She just, it mm -hmm. just looked like some, some woman was trying to use the male's restroom. Mm -hmm. And it, it really showed me that yeah we there needs to be some nuance behind who can hmm. have access to certain bathrooms and i think certain levels of transitioned individuals should be granted access it hmm. shouldn't be so willy-nilly that you just fill out a government form declaring that you're <laughs> like i shouldn't be able to just to declare that i'm a woman and walk into a woman's bathroom or something like that so right. um so that's the difference between like the legal definition and the biological definition and i think they're they hmm. shouldn't necessarily match one to one in every single context yeah. Yeah. um and it's a lot of that's where a lot of the problems and uh, issues arise is when people confuse the legal for the mm -hmm. the actual fact of biology. Yeah, no, that that I hadn't actually thought about it that way, and that that makes intuitive sense, and I think that makes uh, I think that's very helpful. Okay, so tell me about because I know people use this um, as a kind of way of using this, but the whole intersex aspect, people will then use this to say, well, see. It's a spectrum, kind of going with your coin analogy. Mm -hmm. So just define for us what intersex is and then, you know, kind of what it means and then kind of how it's also used. Yeah, so intersex in sort of a clinically relevant sense. So there's, there's a more broad definition that some people bring into that's like any variation uh, away from the typical of, of male and female development. Mm -hmm. So there was some people might describe like the a Kleinfelter syndrome male who's got xxy chromosomes they might say that they uh are intersex but that's not really a good clinically relevant definition of intersex because they're they're definitively male like they're unambiguously male uh a lot they of them just have a chromosomal uh yeah they, uh, they have anomaly. yeah basically they just have an extra um, x and then and then women with turner syndrome who have just one x uh mm -hmm. uh one x chromosome mm -hmm. like they're they're definitively females like they're they're definitely female. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to call these individuals intersex. A, a better way to describe them would be they have a DSD, which is like a, a difference of sex, sexual development, oh, which yeah. is distinct from being intersex. So mm -hmm. intersex conditions, all intersex conditions are DSDs. Not all DSDs are intersex is mm -hmm. one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so to be intersex is basically defined as being sexually ambiguous. So you have ambiguous looking genitalia when you're born the, the doctor might not um be able to de definitively know what your sex is just by a, a glancing at you or that there's some mismatch between your your sexual phenotype and uh, on the outside and sort of your um, internal sexual anatomy so an, an example of that would be individuals that have a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome mm -hmm. where they're they have you know they're xy individuals um, in utero, they, they, their body creates, they have testes, mm -hmm. but the, horm the testosterone that their testes are producing aren't sensed by the body because their cells don't have the ability to um, detect and respond to testosterone. And so they, their bodies mm -hmm. develop, at least externally, 
looking 100% female. And they usually don't even know that they're not female until hmm. they think they should be getting their period and they never do. And then they go for an exam and then they find out, oh, you have internal testes actually. And hmm. you're, you're in a sense, um, biologically male. So that's sort of the intersex definition, either ambiguity or this mismatch, uh, it, which is sorry. only about 0.02% of the population when you sort of get down right. to that. Is it, um, if, if I'm recalling, it's so there's a few, I'm trying to get the uh, classification right. Is it, there are individuals that, as you're saying, they can have either, well, let me just, they could have potentially both genitalia, um, or they could have certain types of tissue of one and you know one's more complete and then have others that are less complete but they have some uh, aspects of both or they have not enough or is that also true or, or is that a different classification yeah i mean you can have individuals that have what look like a penis but also have like a vaginal opening mm -hmm. you can have people who are biologically female that have um have a, a condition where they their genitals become extremely masculinized and it looks like they actually have a penis um and they have their labia have fused and so it looks like they have testes and a penis but in reality they they do not and there's sort of a gradient some individuals have uh with this condition look perfectly female and, and they, they also range into looking very much um very much male mm -hmm. so yeah there's there's sort of a gradient of how your genitals can look and there's also sort of a gradient in your gonads sometimes people can mm -hmm. have one ovary and one testy which is a little bit more rare sometimes you'll have mm -hmm. individuals with ovo testes where they have a combination of both um mm -hmm. uh, tissues mm -hmm. uh, in each so yeah there's there is sort of this middle ground where some people can have sort of be, they can be sexually ambiguous and it and yeah. that can sometimes be a, an external and internal um, difference, right? So maybe they have mm -hmm. some external or kind of the phenotypic kinds of ways of being male or female, but internally they have yeah. parts that are for the other uh, sex. Mm -hmm. And how frequent does, or what's the, I guess, the epidemiology rates of sort of this stuff of how this this happens you had said you know point zero two zero two percent yeah. are intersex it's like point zero one eight i think is the official number for how many individuals fit that definition of sexual ambiguity or the mismatch mm -hmm. um but even a lot of those individuals when we're talking about sexual ambiguity it's sort of just like a visual ambiguity a lot of those individuals also though can can be have their sex determined by a little bit more investigation looking at their internal gonads, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are some, in some cases that might actually be considered truly edge cases mm -hmm. uh, where maybe, you know, if, if you have to have a committee of doctors come in to make a determination, well, what's the, what are the chances that the committee is going to make the same <laughs> call each time, you know? Right. So there's, I think there can be some, some ambiguity. And I was going to say, yeah, in the case where there is the ambiguity, <sighs> Do you have a space where either the parents or the doctors are both kind of, I don't want to say make a decision, but how, how they want to, like in terms of the name or how, they, um, how they're going to identify or what they're going to put on the, on the birth certificate or whatever. How does that decision, I guess, happen or work, if you know? Yeah, that, that's actually one area that I think a lot of the activists have a good point. Like, I don't, I think maybe in some instances, legally, what we put on a birth certificate maybe should be expanded to include intersex individuals yeah. if they want to. Um, I think ultimately some intersex individuals based on their condition can be placed into a male or female category mm. and um, it shouldn't necessarily always be up to them because sometimes they can have an intersex condition. You know, if we just let them decide what they, what their legal sex is. Well, they might actually be biologically male and develop, you know, male um, mm -hmm. secondary sex characteristics that's important for things like sports or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it should be considered like there should be some criteria of what we put in there. But if someone's truly ambiguous, maybe we should let them put an eye on their, mm -hmm. you know, their thing mm -hmm. where they're, they're, it says they're intersex. You know, I'm, I'm fine 
with that, and there should be maybe an exception made for some of those people, because we also want to avoid what's called sort of this intersex genital mutilation where people doctors are going in mm. there and making decisions for, yeah. you know, it's kind of mostly male, let's just make it look like that, or it's like, mm. oh, it's kind of female, let's go in and just do some surgery to make it look mm. more like a certain way. That was a thing that happened a lot in the past, I think probably still happens yeah. to some degree today, and I'm very much against that. Like that's mm -hmm. where I'll agree with a lot of these activists as well. Yeah, is, that doesn't. Is that I don't doesn't. think we should be just operating on on infant genitals unless there's like some, unless it's like blocking their ability to have normal, sure. you know, function like pee or something like that. You know, if, right. Then, um, yeah, if there's not like their health and well being is not in direct and, uh, and risk. I, and I, yeah, I think there's isn't there some uh, there's some folks. I mean, I think most people will you know, no, you know, like Jamie Lee Curtis was, you know, she was, you know, I think she, I don't remember her. I know the, the old I think term she had, is I think she uh, had androgen insensitivity. Yeah. yeah the, the old term was hermaphrodite, which I think is kind of a slur now, if, if, if I, if I understand. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not used. And that wouldn't even, that wouldn't even describe her accurately. Right, either. right, 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 right. So there are some people where it does, I think, I don't, I don't know all of her backstory, but I think it was, she had, yeah, she had the sensitivity, right, to the uh, and yeah. which basically means that she again i don't know her backstory but was there a point where she had to like her parents or the doctors were like she's female or i don't know her story but maybe other well, people I th like i think that. if you know i'm not totally familiar but i think if if she was if she is androgen insensitive which i think that's i remember reading that's what she had mm -hmm. then from birth the doctors would have identified this individual as a female because exactly. it looks like it and mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's totally fine too. Like, even though I would say in a strict biological sense, she'd be male because she has testes and mm -hmm. is producing testosterone, all this stuff in her, uh, her internal organs are male. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it makes sense in any world to have her legally defined as a male because for all intents and purposes, she's, her body has gone down a very female phenotypic mm -hmm. route in development. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not a... I'm not an absolutist on, you know, you are biologically male, therefore, you, like, you cannot play against females yeah. in sports, even though you basically are so typically female. There's a, there's a few, few other things real quick. Um, so there's, we've been focusing a lot on genitalia and all the rest, but how does this scale to when you get secondary sex characteristics, right? So for, yeah. um, for those, you know, to clarify for listeners, secondary sex characteristics are... The fact that um, for men, uh, they have uh, facial hair, um, they have certain, pretty certain amounts of bone density and muscle mass as opposed to connected with women. Women grow uh, or develop, excuse me, uh, breasts and all the rest. Those are differences between the male and female secondary sex characteristics. How does that map on, I guess, to um, how this will work for, I guess, some of these folks that are intersect sometimes you know is it is it just kind of like let's a, let's wait and see like we don't know where it's going to yeah. go necessarily or how does that work i mean it really depends on their condition because some intersex people they sort of have an ambiguous secondary sex characteristics mm. and some people like jamie lee curtis have very much female secondary mm. sexual characteristics the whole um secondary sex characteristic argument for what sex is is, is really common in the among people who advocate for the sex spectrum model. Yeah. Um, this, this, again, fundamentally sort of misunderstands what biological sex is at a fundamental level. Mm -hmm. So we have primary sex characteristics, which are um, your, your gonads, your um, testes, scrotum, penis, all this stuff. And then there's, there's primary sexual organs, which is just your, your gonads. Um, and these are basically what determine an individual's sex there's a lot of people who then think that secondary sex characteristics is how a sex is defined hmm. but that's that is not true <laughs> so secondary sex characteristics are what um the changes your body undergoes through puberty when your body starts creating either producing estrogen from ovaries or testosterone from your testes and it causes your body to go through these these changes that we you know we all go through in, in puberty um the reason the sex, se secondary sex characteristics aren't your sex is basically because they are not relevant towards sexual reproduction at a you know at a at a
basic level in terms of what types of gamete you're going to be producing. So a, a male that has very feminine features or, you know, breast tissue, they're still just as male as, you know, Randy Macho Man Savage, uh, just because, you know, they both share the same re type of reproductive organism, uh, or organs. Um, same thing with sort of more masculine or butch females, like they're, they're mm -hmm. not less female because they happen to be having these masculinized secondary sex characteristics. I think that's actually a really terrible way to look at it too, because it sort of justifies this kind of a playground bully mentality where mm -hmm. if you're defining individual sex based on sex characteristics. Yeah. You know, I remember growing up in school and whenever you, one of the, my uh, friends who were boys or whatever would, you know, if, if they expressed any amount of femininity, mm -hmm. they would just be, harassed and it's like what are you a girl or mm -hmm. you know if you have a tomboy they'd be accused of being a boy but the whole like sex spectrum model if you ascribe to this idea that secondary sex characteristics determine your sex then they'd have to actually seriously think like maybe i am a girl maybe i'm really not a boy if i have mm -hmm. these secondary sex characteristics that are more feminine mm -hmm. i think that's just like a very very bad way to look at it whereas we should be sort of expanding our notion of what what uh, acceptable male and female behavior is rather than trying to say that you're no longer a a male because you happen to have these um you know you have breast development or something like that's that just seems very very cruel and also factually wrong so yeah uh, yeah and, and, and in that way femininity and masculinity isn't it in, in this way that i'm meaning it doesn't it make sense to say uh, I want to say this right, that it is a sort of spectrum in the sense of, not biologically, but in the sense of there's not only one way to be a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, there's differences, like, in terms of interest or, you know, maybe some men, like, you know, reading Shakespeare and cooking and other men, like, you know, wrestling and destroying shit. <laughs> yeah, right? like, I mean, you're... you're... Your sex only tells you what types of, you know, what role you would hypothetically play in reproduction. I mean, that's really all it should be telling us mm -hmm. uh, or what we should have it tell us about ourselves. It's just a very strict biological thing. It's just like we all have certain color eyes. That doesn't say anything about you as a, as a human. Mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't, people with certain color eyes shouldn't be prohibited for behaving in certain ways. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think into that to that point of it is in terms of behavior or how things happen. I feel like I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like in some ways, the transgender kind of aspect of things sometimes will be like that very piece, you know, I am a man or I'm a woman. But I don't have the stereotypical ways or interest or I feel more like the opposite sex. So I'm going to transition my whole my, re my reproductive organs to make it align with that. And I wonder if we had a better conversation in society about, well, wait a minute, <laughs> the way you behave or your actions, they maybe don't fit into these stereotypes, but that doesn't make you less biologically male. We just have to have a better uh, idea of the differences between, you know, um, or the differences within each gender and how it manifests or how, how it interacts something, something like yeah. that. Or how do you feel? I, about I that? totally agree. I think this is why I'm more concerned with the way that this sort of gender ideology is mm -hmm. being taught, especially to children yeah. where they're, yeah. they're taught that sex is sort of this spectrum and you can't talk about them being males or females. There's just maleness or femaleness. And, you know, you can, if, if you think you're whatever sex you just, and then you just are, and then they talk about a lot of the gender ideology really is based on just stereotypical behavior, like just mm -hmm. these regressive, yeah. I find conservative yeah, stereotypes. Sure. Yeah. And then this confuses kids to think that, you know, you have this effeminate boy who's, you know, doesn't understand biological sex very well because they've been told that it's just a social construct and they find themselves liking the things that girls are liking more. They like playing with dolls more or they like hanging out. They have more friends that are girls they could be legitimately confused about what that means about their sex. And right. they might think that they're trans, whereas in reality, they're just a very effeminate male who would more likely just grow up to be a gay, a gay man than they would, mm -hmm. you know, a trans woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's to me, that's, 
the most dangerous thing we got going right now is this sort of indoctrinating kids into being so confused about their their sex and what mm-hmm. their behaviors mean about yes whether or not they're male or female or trans or whatever right um yeah it's yeah it's kind of horrifying. I, i've pulled up here real quick and i just i wanted to hit this <clears throat> with you with um you've seen this ginger gingerbread person right you've seen this this visual oh, yeah. this graph? i wrote a i wrote an essay on that <laughs> oh, did you write it? okay send it to me and i'll put it in the notes but yeah. just just okay. just as a reminder Basically, it has like a gender for a man, and it has like the brain, and it says identity, and it will say man or woman, gender queer, and then it will say orientation, and it will have like a heart, and it will say heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, and then it says biological sex, and it will say male, female, intersex, and then it says uh, kind of the the outline of the gender man, uh, gender expression, when it would be feminine, masculine, androgynous. And I don't know, what do you think about that just in general? I mean, I don't want you to regurgitate the article. I'll put it in the, in the yeah, notes, yeah. but just briefly, well, it, that seems like that kind of way in which people, you know, activists are kind of trying to teach people about these things in, yeah. in ways that are just in many ways not <laughs> rooted in biological science. Yeah, I mean, this is used in, in schools. I mean, this is mm-hmm. yeah. being taught. I don't know what version you have, but if it, in the box you have that says biological sex, does it list the traits? Is in the, uh, the yes, them. yes, I have that one. Yeah, I see this one here. Read, yeah. read the traits. What does it say that the traits are for biological sex? There's a few versions of it, so I want to see which one you have. This one says, uh, biological sex refers to the objectivity measurable organs, hormones, and chromosomes. Female equals vagina ovaries, XX chromosomes. Male equals penis, testes, XY chromosomes. Intersex equals a combination of the two. That's actually much better than the previous version. Oh, I okay. Said. Okay, yeah. So, that, I was like, so yeah. That, one, that one at least... I think talked about sperm production or, or gametes or to some degree. Uh-huh. Did it say that? Yeah. It says so that's testes, actually ovaries. Yeah, yeah. That's actually much better. Um, I, I still don't think, you know, chromosomes again, aren't the definition of your sex and your hormones again, aren't what defines your sex. You know, those, these are consequent, like your, your hormone production is a consequence of your sex. It doesn't mm-hmm. determine your sex. So there's still some factually wrong things in there. Mm-hmm. The previous version that I talked about in one of my articles, under the whole biological sex, it included things like voice pitch and body hair and things oh, like nice. that, which is saying like, oh, so your biological sex, if you're a boy and you have a, you know, a, a, a little high voice, then you're less male. And mm-hmm. if you're a, a particularly hairy female, does that make you more yeah. male? Right. So I think yeah. they probably got <laughs> a lot of pushback we on that. So they, that they've one, changed yeah. it. So it's, it's definitely, that's a lot better. It's yeah. one of the few times I've actually heard them even bring up testes or ovaries. So that's, mm-hmm. at least that's an improvement. Mm-hmm. Still not, still not great basing right. it on hormones. Cause if you, if you base what your sex is on hormones, then they would say that, oh, well, then a trans woman who's taking estrogen, right. they're, is, they're hormonally that. female now. And it's right. like, well, you can't be hormonally, you know, your, your sex isn't based on your hormones. Like mm-hmm. hormones guide your, you know, rep- the, the reproductive, the, the, the way your body develops and things like that, but it's, mm-hmm. you could have a male with estrogen is just a male with estrogen. Yeah. So, yeah. So here's my, my last question for you. Cause you have been, I mean, beyond generous with your time, <laughs> beyond generous. Um, where, where would you, in terms of the um, ideas of uh, sex and gender and, and, in that conversation we're having, where would you like to see it go in a healthy way or what kinds of a tone and demeanor that you wish could happen? And, and how do you, you know, you want to try and necessarily do that with either your book or your writing or all the rest. And, um, and just what's a better way, I guess, of trying to have this conversation. It needs to be from a place of compassion for one. I mean, I'll, I'll tweet things out and sometimes, you know, I think most of my followers are pretty well behaved, <laughs> but when you get enough followers, you know, it's big numbers, you're going to have a lot of assholes that are, that show up there. And so I'll, right. I'll talk about biological sex is one thing. And then I'll get a bunch of people that are just calling people names or, you know, just, you know, just being super mean and it doesn't help the argument. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the debate whatsoever. We need to be compassionate towards 
trans individuals, towards intersex individuals. They're dealing with a whole lot of stuff. They are there is legitimate bigotry out there against these individuals that needs right. to be acknowledged. Like they are an oppressed group. I don't. I mean, there's that's just a fact. I think they are. Yeah. Um, I think it doesn't help their situation when some of these more extreme activists deny basic biology. Mm -hmm. I see what I'm doing as trying to help them in, in certain ways to be mm -hmm. very clear about what their conditions are, what they have, because this is going to inform what kind of treatment they should be receiving. Of course, um, yeah. And it also it, it touches on areas where there could be certain groups that experience discrimination that have conflicting interests. You know, we can't have, you know, trans women who just be, just because they identify as women then compete in women's sports leagues because right. the whole point of women's sports leagues is to be a protected league against so they don't have <laughs> males who are have physical advantages. Right. So we just we need to be clear on biology because it it helps well, it just helps everything. You can't have like actual justice by by ignoring science across the board, like it, there needs it needs to be grounded in truth fundamentally, mm -hmm. and that's in order for us to make actual progress on any of these issues. So I I want people to be factually accurate. I want them to be compassionate. Um, yeah, I mean those are those are the two two main things I think we need to do, and that's that's what I try to do. Um, even though I'm I get called terrible names <laughs> no, <laughs> on no, a daily basis, I know you do. I know you do. but uh, yeah, but ultimately I think. Yeah, we need more people to feel like they can actually speak up and talk about these things. And the biggest problem is that we have just a, an environment where we're not allowed to say these things. I'm in a position where I can talk about these things because I don't have a you know a family to take care of. You know, I don't have yeah. any children. If I was in academia and I had you know small children to feed, and the only way I can do it is by being an evolutionary biologist, well, mm -hmm. I very likely wouldn't have ever written my first essay to, you know, combat some of this stuff because the stakes are just too high. Yeah. So yeah, people need to do what they can do, uh, which doesn't mean writing articles in Quillette or the new, or the wall street journal, <laughs> it is uh, whatever you can do in, in your immediate environment to help that doesn't completely risk your ability to support yourself. Um, yeah. Those are encouraged, but yeah. Com truth and compassion. I yeah, suppose I, I, I like it. I like it. That's uh, it's nice. Um, okay. So tell people real quick where can they find you? Where can they? Uh, where are some relevant places they can read your stuff? Uh, you can I can link some of it in the notes. But uh, where, where where can they read your stuff? Where can they find you online? And uh, when can they look for you at next in other places? Yeah. So you can I guess read some of my essays. Most of them are in Quillette. Mm -hmm. um, I had one article in the Wall Street Journal. You can follow me on Twitter is probably the best place to follow me. It's where I'm most active. Mm -hmm. And my handle is swipe right. My last mm -hmm. name is right. W-R-A-G-H-T. Mm -hmm. um, I also have an Instagram. that's sort of more geared towards whiskey and fitness and dietary stuff. I almost went the fitness route when I left academia. I thought I was going to be a personal trainer oh, uh, nice. before Colette swooped me up. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so, uh, so I do, I'm, I'm passionate about fitness and stuff. So I'm swipe right fitness on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, I just started a Substack recently, so colinwright.substack.com, nice. uh, where most of the content there is free, but some of it won't be. I haven't decided which ones won't be yet, but uh, I'll probably mm -hmm. drop some some paywalled articles at some point. <laughs> but uh, yeah. until then, you can follow me on there, and um, it's meant for sort of smaller articles that are short and sweet that maybe aren't appropriate for you know a two thousand word essay in Quillette and are maybe a little too long to to put in a in a in a twitter thread mm -hmm. so uh that's sort of what i'm shooting for with the sub stack so okay. check me out there and no, i think that's that's, that's yeah that's it. all that's all great uh <laughs> colin it's been so so nice having you on and and talking to you you're i mean really if if uh, uh i know we're both probably a little tired but i mean you're you're just a joy to talk to uh i could probably go another three hours but <laughs> three hours is is a really good stopping point i feel like we hit a lot um super informative Thanks super so helpful you're you're a very very good person very nice person and extremely uh, bright and intelligent so keep doing what you're doing don't let uh oh, I will. it's my people, job now basically yeah, so. <laughs> follow that passion and and i will obviously keep yeah. uh engaging with you and talking to you and 
you have an open door to come on and try out ideas or, or whatever else cool. and, and, and talk here. So uh, I hope we can in the Let's future. Let's do it again at some point for sure. Yeah, for sure. Alrighty, man. Thank you. See ya.